Hello everyone, welcome to the Dry Dock episode 249. That means, of course, it is the Patreon Dry Dock, and it's going to run on for a little while. So, let's get started with questions ASAP. Textless and La Choc asks, World War II is a clear beginning point of the US Navy's reign as the world's most powerful navy, but is there a similar beginning point for the Royal Navy? Was there some event that just made it clear that they were the dominant power on the seas, or did they just keep building ships to meet needs and protect holdings in increasingly far-flung corners of the world until one day everyone looked round and realised that, as Napoleon put it, wherever wood can swim, there I am sure to find this flag of England. I mean, where exactly you'd put the US Navy's reign as top navy in World War II is obviously something that we've discussed on the channel before and it's still open to a lot of debate. I personally would probably, I think nowadays, I'd probably go with somewhere around about mid to late 1943. Uh, but in terms of the Royal Navy, whilst it might sound a bit cliche, the Battle of Trafalgar is probably that point. Um, the Napoleonic Wars generally, I think, are, would be the conflict because up until then, both the French and Spanish navies were, you know, contending back and forth through various wars with varying degrees of success with the Royal Navy. And they certainly had large battle fleets and, to be honest, would continue to do so after the Napoleonic Wars. However, whilst mass fleet confrontation did occur on a semi-regular basis during the various 18th century wars, after Trafalgar it's notable that although especially the French continue to try and build more and more ships to enhance their fleet, you didn't actually end up with another Trafalgar-style fleet confrontation. And then by 1815, uh, with the end, final end of the Napoleonic Wars, this kind of new status quo was then acknowledged in the treaties, and you end up with what people tend to term the Pax Britannica, roughly 100 years of British naval dominance, where, again, people will try and build up to contest the Royal Navy's hold on the ocean, much as the Warsaw Pact tried to do in the Cold War period, but they never quite actually managed to do so. And this actually has a direct bearing on the suppression of the African slave trade, or at least the West African slave trade, over to the north and south, southern american continents because if you look at the treaty negotiations in 1815 and some of the subsequent immediately after treaty negotiations and a few before when various nations were also bang out of the napoleonic wars you will notice that the royal well the british use the royal navy's dominance of the seas as kind of a leverage and a beating stick to try and get some of the earliest mutual agreements to allow Royal Navy vessels to board, search, and seize slaving vessels of other nations. So they couldn't have done that unless the other nations were, you know, capable of acknowledging that, yes, actually, the British are pretty much in charge of the seas and could do this regardless. So we might as well get a few minor concessions out of them. Otherwise, they, as, well, as we're shown with the West Africa Squadron, they might very well go and just seize stuff anyway. Gabriel A. Hawkins asks, Whilst I certainly don't disagree with the substantive points you raise about the Congo's deficiencies, in the spirit of academic discourse, do you think there's an incongruity between your view of the Congos when compared to their wartime usefulness? The Japanese Navy easily got more use out of them than the Yamatos, Nagatos, Iseis and Fusos combined, and I challenge you to name any other class of battleship that actively participated in so many campaigns. I don't think there's much of an incongruity between the fact that I define the Congo still as battle cruisers and the fact that they ended up being more useful in terms of effective operations to the Japanese Navy than the other Japanese battleships. Because it, as it turns out, it seems the battle cruisers generally tend to get a bit more use out of them than the battleships. Possibly because the battle cruisers tend to be seen as able to be detached for loan operations or loan operations as compared to the full battle fleet. So they might still have other battle cruisers and escorts in attendance. And I think this is borne out, you know, when you look at the heyday of the battle cruiser in World War One. So if you think about it, the high seas fleet, its big ticket is the Battle of Jutland and a secondary one partial deployment for Operation Albion 
other than that, although they do make a number of deployments, they don't accomplish all that much. Likewise, for the Grand Fleet, the Grand Fleet also has Jutland to its name and a bunch of other deployments and escort jobs, but they don't actually do all that much either um, outside in terms of you know, major impact on the war. The two big collections of battleships basically spend most of the war staring at each other across the North Sea. But in comparison, the British battle cruisers in various ways, shapes and forms. Obviously, they have Jutland, but you also have Dogger Bank. You have First and Second Heligoland Bight. You have the Falklands, the pursuit of, even if not entirely successful, Goban, which itself is another battle cruiser, which obviously had a fairly significant impact on the war. And then you flip it around, obviously, for the Germans, they've got Dogger Bank and Jutland as well. The other side of the pursuit of Goban and a couple of other missions, which you know, kind of illustrate that the navy, the, the navy getting more use out of its battle cruisers than they do out of their battleships, does have something of a precedent. And even in the Second World War, I mean, okay, there's not that many battle cruisers around compared to uh, World War One, but obviously you've got the Congos as you mentioned, and then the other navy that has battle cruisers, at least unless you want to get into the whole argument of whether the Scharnhorst battle cruisers or not, which we're going to avoid for the minute is, of course, the Royal Navy, and Renown, Repulse, and even to a certain extent Hood, were very heavily used. Uh, Repulse and Hood, obviously, until they were lost, but Renown continued to be extremely heavily used and saw quite a number of different actions during the Second World War. So I'd actually say that, broadly speaking, and we are talking very broadly because we're encompassing you know, it's multiple major navies in two separate world wars, but it does seem that actually the fact that the Congos had so much use from the Japanese Navy probably actually pushes towards them being more correctly termed battle cruisers still in the Second World War than battleships, because the battle cruiser seems to be the more versatile, more heavily used vessel. Donovan Lawler asks, in your opinion, which of the free navies and minor power navies were the most successful based on their overall impact on the war on both sides in World War II? I think it, it's rather difficult to quantify precisely because you have to look for very small navies. Obviously, they can have a role in a single specific but very major incident, or they might have roles in a number of smaller but, you know, collectively quite important incidents, but their relatively small size means that a single major loss or a single major battle can throw things out quite a lot. So you have to go with kind of overall impressions rather than, I think, specifically quantifying things. And in that vein depending on exactly when you define them as having become a free navy as opposed to just the regular navy, I think you could probably make an argument for the Dutch, the free Dutch navy, having been the most successful based on their overall impact. Albeit, that is, presuming that once the Netherlands falls, it is classified as the free Dutch navy, even though Obviously, they still had their East, uh, well, Southeast Asian holdings for a while until the Japanese took those away as well. It, it you know, the, the the Free Polish Navy did quite a bit and actually grew to quite considerably in size during the war. The Free Norwegian Navy got some surprisingly heavy blows in as well. Obviously, helping with a number of fairly important battles, but and in large part thanks to the fact that as the um, as the largest navy starting out, despite the rather horrific losses that the Dutch navy took, especially against the Japanese as part of ABDA command, the Dutch still, after all those losses, were kind of starting out their period as a free navy with more people and with more ships, and thus you know, their, their ability to scale up was also... Uh, somewhat more and by the, by default therefore they had you know a larger presence than most of the other free navies which then meant that they could exert more influence which would therefore make them the most successful based on overall impact obviously that isn't to diminish the role of the other free navies but i think just through being 
pretty much the largest of the free navies um, uh, for various periods, and especially with things like a fairly powerful submarine arm for a free navy, the Dutch probably edge it out, although I would think their comp main competition would probably be the free Polish navy. How many Blackburns could a Blackburn Blackburn burn if a Blackburn Blackburn could burn Blackburn Blackburns asks? What is the rank of the officer in charge of a World War II Royal Navy destroyer? And what would be the average age of such an officer at the start of World War II? It varies depending on the type of destroyer. So the average destroyer seems to be commanded by a lieutenant commander. But uh, flotilla leaders and some destroyers that are assigned to lead particular formations, say a convoy which has a destroyer as a convoy leader, might also have a commander. And some of the newer and larger destroyers, such as the tribal class or the J class, seem to have been assigned captains. So, you know, the bigger ships have of the destroyers have slightly more senior commanders, but the typical destroyer seems to have a lieutenant commander aboard. And judging by when those various lieutenant commanders were born and the start of World War II, the age range appears to be mostly averaging around their early 30s, with some in their late 20s, some in their mid 30s. So that seems to be the average age of the average destroyer captain in World War II in the Royal Navy. Although, of course, as I said, if you were looking at some of the bigger ones, the Tribals, the Js, Ks, etc., you might end up with a captain who's in his mid to late 30s, possibly, possibly early 40s, although that'd be somewhat rare. And then at the other end, you have things like the old V&W class, which might have even younger commanders, possibly even one or two lieutenants thrown in there, especially in, in the state of war. But the era of lieutenants being in command regularly of destroyers, as was the case in the First World War, seems to have gone away somewhat. Ash the Lego Guy asks, It seems that, in general, on capital ships from the Dreadnought to the start of the Cold War, some of the thickest pieces of armour on a ship would be the face of the main gun turrets. Whilst this kept the peace of mind of those gun crews, it seems that all, for all the variables of a salvo in battle, it's about as easy as landing a dart on the back of another dart as to hit the face of a turret. Were there cases where roughly equal gun ships hit the face armour of an opponent's main gun turret, and the armour provided enough protection for the gun turret to continue to remain in action? It's somewhat more common when you come to cruisers, but when it comes to battleships, I was going through various records of battleship or battle cruiser, i.e. gun capital ship base engagements where the turret took a hit. And it's surprisingly difficult to find instances where the um, turret face armor actually fully did its job. Now, admittedly, a good chunk of hits to turrets are hits to the roofs or hits to the sides or hits to the barbettes, which doesn't help us in this particular circumstance, although they are the more common type. Um, this, of course, being Saedlitz, which has unhelpfully taken a shell hit that's gone straight through the turret, uh, or at least through the turret front. Um, but when it comes to verifiable instances where shells have hit the turret faceplate, usually... Although there are a number of instances where the turret armor has done its job and protected the crew inside, it still usually disables the turret, at least for a while. For example, um, Jean Barr took a 16-inch hit from south um, from the South Dakota class USS Massachusetts, and although that didn't penetrate the front of the turret, it did jam the turret. Um, I think, if I remember correctly, it actually... Um, displaced the turret faceplate armor in such a way that it jammed the turret. But whilst, as is, you know, whilst that's um, kept the crew alive, it's not allowed the gun to the guns to remain in action, which was what Ash the Lego guy asked. The only incident that really immediately comes to mind in that instance is Kirishima at its last action off Guadalcanal where it managed to plant a 14-inch round into the faceplate of the USS South Dakota, and that didn't actually impair the function of South Dakota's guns. There were plenty of other things impairing the functions of South Dakota's main guns, but that was not one of them. And part of the problem with that is that the best analysis seems to have been indicating that, one, it was a glancing blow, two, it probably hit actually on the 
side plating immediately adjacent to the face plating, and it was probably by a six inch shell. So yeah, not helpful. I mean, if anybody else knows a battleship that was struck on its turret face plate by a battleship caliber shell, and the turret remained in operation, not was knocked out of action and came back again a few hours later after some changes, but actually, you know, just been, oh, oh that's interesting, we'll keep firing. Yeah, that'd be an interesting one to find out. I'm sure, I'm sure somewhere in the back of my mind, there that must have happened at least once or twice, but I can't immediately think of one. Switch374 asks, I read a brief paragraph about a battle when the Texas brig Wharton, back when Texas was still a country, and the sloop of war Austin fought against Mexico's steam paddle frigate Guadalupe and the iron steam frigate Montezuma, and the Texas ships won the day. It stated that this was the only battle in which sail warships won against steam-powered warships. Is this true, and can you tell us a little about the battle? If it's not true, what other battles did sail vessels win against steam-powered ones? So this was the Battle of Campeche, or Campeche, depending on how you want to pronounce it. Briefly speaking, tactically it was a draw. Um, both sides actually had to return to port to repair and rearm after suffering reasonable amounts of damage. However, the fact was that the Mexican squadron was blockading the port of Campeche, which obviously therefore the blockade was broken by the Texan Yucatan unit, which managed to cause this damage, even though, as I said, they also had to go back to repair their own damage. The reason for that battle was all to do with the early 1800s and the various secessions from Mexico, which resulted in a number of independent states being created, most of them short-lived, um, but of course Texas went on to join the United States instead, which, well, now it's an integral part of the United States. And as far as being the only instant in which sail warships won against steam-powered warships, as I've just pointed out, it, it wasn't really an outright victory. On a, on a tactical level, both sides had to leave. It's just that strategically that meant a loss for the Mexican forces. But in terms of overall sail versus steam warship confrontations, it's difficult to quantify because in the era when both sail-powered purely and steam-powered purely warships were around and capable of confronting each other, one, there weren't too many major conflicts, and to where there were, both sides tended to have a mix of vessels. So there's quite a few instances where there were steam-powered and sail-powered vessels on both sides, and one side came off the winner, but obviously that doesn't fit these exact criteria. And by the time of the American Civil War, although you still do have a fair number of sail-only powered vessels in the Union and Confederate fleets, most of the battles where it's only sail-powered vessels on one side or the other tend to be against land fortifications, where you end up with some of the sail-powered only vessels facing off against steam-powered vessels. It, again, is in conjunction with other steam-powered vessels on their own side, for the most part. So, as far as I'm aware, there wasn't any major confrontation in this period where sail-powered warships won flat out against steam-powered warships, at least when we're talking about what you might term rated ships, frigates and upwards. Um, small conflicts between you know, schooners and gunboats and so forth, a lot of those tend to either go unrecorded or very badly recorded, so who knows what happened with them. Matt Kidd asks, The difference in speed between the Iowas and the other US fast battleships was roughly the same as the difference between those fast battleships and the standards. Did the US Navy have doctrine worked out as to how the standards, the fast battleships, and the very fast battleships would engage the enemy if all three types of battleships were present in a Jutland-style engagement with the enemy line of battle? I don't believe so. Now, obviously, feel free to correct me if you know differently, but as far as I can tell, the only times that the standards and any of the fast battleships, be they North Carolina, South Dakotas, or Iowa's, were deployed in the same unit was when they were going in for shore bombardment missions, at which point nobody was proceeding at a particularly high speed, and it therefore really didn't matter all that much. Whereas when you look at the deployments of the US battleships when they were out either running carrier escort or attack and shore bombardment missions, uh, a, a offensive ones like the raid on truck or something like that, uh, 
then you pretty much always see the fast battleships, whether that be the Iowas or the others, all working together. And the standards, if they're even involved in that operation at all, are grouped into a completely different area, or very often not even in the same task force. So I think the US Navy probably didn't have a precise doctrine as to how they should all operate together in the event of a massive enemy battle line engagement. And to be fair, they probably didn't need one. I mean, you look at Leyte Gulf, 7th Fleet with all the standards is down in one area, whilst all the fast battleships, again, a mix of all three types, are up with Halsey and the carriers. And when you think about it, to a certain degree, this makes a lot of sense. At the time, the US Navy would be developing such a doctrine, if indeed they were. If you look at the various navies, the Germans, at their strongest in terms of fast capital ships, would have the two Scharnhorst and one of the Bismarcks, because neither of the Bismarcks were operational at the same time. So that's three fast capital ships. If the US Navy is going to be confronting those, they're going to be doing in conjunction with the Royal Navy. So they're going to have a preponderance of firepower just in fast capital ship terms, even if it's just one North Carolina class, because the Royal Navy will send along a King George V or two at least. Against the Italians, if that shakes out. Now, to be fair, the Italians actually have more fast capital ships than the Germans do, but they the, a lot of them are the older ones, the uh, Duilios and Cavours, so you're not really going to be kept up at night wondering about what's, who's going to win in a fight between Giulio Cesare and USS Alabama, for example. You only really have to worry about the two Littorios. Again, the US Navy by the, has the preponderance of ships by the time they're involved in the Mediterranean in any significant way. If they, if they wanted to have that confrontation, then they could just put more fast capital ships in. And then you think about the Japanese... Well, the only ships that can keep up with the fast capital ships are the Yamatos, which of there are two, and the Congos, of which there are four. And, well, there's 10 US fast capital ships all to, once they're all completed. Um, and even when you're just looking at the South Dakotas and the North Carolinas, the Congos, well, we kind of know what happens when a Congo tries to tangle with a North Carolina, let alone a fully operational South Dakota. So, and then once the Iowa's come online, obviously, still, there's there's no real reason to worry. Now, yes, you have the Nagatos, the Fusos, and the Isays, which could bulk up the numbers, but they're slower. So if that occurs, well, in the early part of the war their US ships can just go full speed and then they can fight either part of the Japanese battle line that can keep up with them or just not. Uh, and in the latter part of the war, there are 10 US fast capital ships. And even if all of the Japanese battleships and battle cruisers were still operational by that stage, the Japanese only have 12. And again, you know, Fusos, Isays, Congos versus US fast capital ships you know, that, that's easy money, um, which basically means that essentially you really only have to worry about the Nagatos and the Yamatos. Now, fair enough, the Yamatos are a bit of a threat, but it's four, um, not everybody else. Um, and yeah, therefore, that I don't think anyone would have been under any pressure to develop a doctrine for a full battle line engagement, which would sacrifice a huge amount of the strategic mobility and the tactical mobility of the fast battleships when there's a relatively small number of standards that could get involved anyway in the early part of the war, thanks to Pearl Harbor. And by the time of the latter part of the war, when there's a lot of standards, including the refits, well, there's a lot of fast battleships as well. There was obviously a doctrine for the Iowas to operate with the slower South Dakotas and North Carolinas, but that doctrine basically consisted of the Iowas go at 27, 28 knots along with everybody else, unless and until it's advantageous to accelerate and hook around the enemy. Vinve asks, how common was it to have warships named after the same actual person in different navies during the period the channel covers? The example that comes to mind is the HMS Prince Eugene and SMS Prince Eugen, dash USS Prince Eugen, and the Italian Eugenio di Savoia. Does that make Prince Eugene of Savoy the person with the most namesake ships in the most navies? Also, could you recommend a book about warship designs that were never built? 
it's not that common to have warships from different navies all named after the same person from a reasonable degree of proximity, mostly because in order to get a ship named after you, you have to have done something of significant service either directly for that country or perhaps for the alliance that that country is part of. And it's usually the first one, which means that one nation will have a vested interest in naming a ship after that person, and none of the other nations will. And in fact, a lot of the other nations might have distinct reasons not to like that person, because usually the stuff that they did for one nation was against another one. But as you point out with uh, Eugene of Savoy, he did get um, a number of ships named after him, which ironically enough meant that in the Second World War, Prince Eugene, Eugene of Savoy was a great ally of the UK, and the two ships that fought during the Second World War that were named after him were both in service of the UK's enemies, but never mind. Um, but occasionally you do get an officer who, or someone like that who goes out and does something either that's so remarkable that multiple people want to name ships after him, or... Um, he goes out and does remarkable things for more than one nation. So Admiral Cochrane is an example. So <laughs> during the First World War, there was HMS Cochrane, which was an armoured cruiser, and there was the Ch um, Chilean Almirante Cochrane, which was initially an ironclad and was going to be the sister ship of Almirante Latore until it got turned into HMS Eagle, and thus the ironclad kept the name throughout the First World War. So there were two ships named after Admiral Cochrane, during the second, uh, the First World War, I should say. Uh, the Dutch, of all people, had a third-rate ship of the line called the Washington, um, which was then captured by the Royal Navy, which meant that both the Dutch and the Royal Navy operated a ship called Washington, which is, of course, named in honour of George Washington, which the US also had some USS Washingtons in and around that time period. And, of course, very occasionally, a ship named after a famous person in one country, especially in the age of sail, would be captured by another nation who may choose to continue operating it with a different prefix as their own vessel, but then the original nation might rebuild that vessel or build another vessel with the same name, which you'd then have two different navies operating ships named after the same person, one of which is actually the successor to the other. Greb asks, was Qingdao the only naval base Germany had outside Germany in World War I? And how did they support ships in the African colonies, for example? Did they use colliers? And how many bases did the Royal Navy have outside of the UK in World War I? In terms of a f official naval bases, then yes, the only Kaiserliche Marina naval base outside of Germany was Qingdao. Um, which is apparently how you pronounce Tao, I've been told. When it comes to things like German East Africa, they had harbour facilities, but it doesn't seem they were specifically naval harbour facilities, i.e., you know, naval ships could use the places to repair. There may be some naval stores, uh, and obviously there would be coal because these harbours would also be servicing civilian vessels, not just, um, not, not just the military ones. So they didn't have to send specific colliers to the African colonies for the military ships. There would just be collier traffic there generally to supply civilian traffic and the naval ships could take from that. Now, as far as British <laughs> overseas bases go, um, if you have a copy of either Jane's Fighting Ships of World War One, Jane's Fighting Ships 1914, or... Um, a, a prop, roughly, if you want to get more approximate, uh, a co any copy of Jane's Fighting Ships that immediately precedes the war, um, you'll find, quite usefully, that they have a section before each navy which describes their docks, yards, and harbours, and divides them up between uh, the naval stuff, uh, mercantile only, and private when it comes to shipyards. So, um, British <laughs> dockyards and harbours overseas... Uh, according to Jane's, uh, include Malta, Gibraltar, Alexandria, Aden, Bombay, Calcutta, Colombo, Madras, Mahe, Mauritius, Penang, Rangoon, Singapore, Suez, Hong Kong, Wei Highway, Eskimalt, Cape Co Coast Castle, Port Stanley, St. Helena, Sierra Leone, Simons Bay, Bermuda, Bridgetown, Halifax, Adelaide, Auckland, Brisbane, Hobart, King George Sound, Sydney, Melbourne. And uh, that's 
the 1906-1907 uh, Janes, which I will put to one side. And uh, let's see if we have any more. Uh, I think we mentioned Mauritius, Mauritius uh, Karachi, Bombay, Calcutta. That's in uh, fighting ships of World War One. Um, Port side is apparently separate from Alexandria by World War One. Where we mentioned the Suez Canal already. Um, already mentioned Hong Kong and Singapore. Um, then you've got oh, Bermuda, Bridgetown, St. John's, Trinidad. We mentioned Escamalt already. Um, yeah, so that's uh, a listing relatively comprehensively of various British overseas bases of some description or other uh, that's specifically earmarked as having a specific naval component in World War One, or at least at the beginning of World War One. George A. Robertson asks, there were three very successful American warship classes, the Iowas, the Essexes, and the Fletchers, that were designed before World War II. Without being snarky, what did the designers know that others did not, or were they just plain lucky? Was it because they were all designed to fight in the Pacific against Japan, and thus the designs were spot on? Uh, well, part of it was that uh, they weren't designed before World War II. They were designed before America got involved in World War II, but that is a rather critical difference, which counts, you know, two and a half, almost two and a half years of actual war. And that informed American design quite a bit. Now, that's not to say that that's the sole reason. Um, part of the reason for the success of those ships was a bunch of underlying excellent technology, reliable high-pressure steam plants, the 5-inch 38, the best dual-purpose gun of the war, um, the various fire control systems and all of that combined with American industry because, of course, it's all very well and good having built a really, really excellent fire control system, but unless you can mass produce it and put it on every single ship and perhaps put multiple versions of it on every single ship like they did with the Mark 37, for example, then otherwise it's not quite so useful. Whereas with the US, they were able to put Mark 37s and 5-inch 38s on basically anything that floated. So that, there's an element to that, but a lot of the specific design elements, the sort of minute things that can be traced to their success in the war, is because of a mixture of tape being able to take on board the lessons of Britain, for the most part, during the first few years of war, and incorporate them into their designs, and to a certain extent with some systems even their own war experience, because once the ships were designed, you actually have to, also have, to have to build them. So, for example, with the Fletchers, one thing I've praised quite a bit, and which explains why the Fletchers were quite so durable, was that they had a degree of splinter-proof plating. Now, that that's not armour per se, um, but it, as the name suggests, stops splinters from holding the ship and knocking out various systems and so on and so forth. The reason that was introduced into the Fletchers' design was because they were reviewing early war damage reports from British destroyers, and they'd noticed that quite often a British destroyer would be able to evade an incoming bomb hit, so it wouldn't get hit, it would be a near miss, but that destroyer could still suffer damage or even systems failure because it had managed, the splinter had come through the side and managed to sever a steam line or something. And so, ah, well... That seems like a unnecessary hazard. We shall incorporate some splinter proofing down the sides of our ships. And suddenly the Fletchers are significantly stronger against near misses than any class of destroyer that had preceded them. With the Iowas and the Essexes, not only were they able to incorporate, a, well, not so much with the Iowas, but especially with the Essexes, they were able to incorporate to a degree the experience that British carriers had had during the early part of the war, although the Essex design was a bit further along and harder to alter. So these were smaller changes. And then when it comes to other things on the Essexes, you, you know, by the time they're entering service, bear in mind they're in, first of the Essexes are entering service in early 43, they're also able to look at their early war, own early war experience, like the loss of Lexington to the internal fires at the Battle of Coral Sea and incorporate the lessons in damage control, like, you know, purging the petrol pump systems, the Avgas systems, and then that's incorporated into the Essexes from the start, which makes the Essexes much less likely to go up like the Lexington did. And similarly with the Iowas, by the time the Iowas have come into service, they've had battle experience with at least the North Carolinas and maybe one or two of the South Dakotas as well. 
And again, although that's not going to change the fundamental design aspects of the iOS because they're already under construction, they are able to incorporate small changes to systems and so forth, which obviously improve things. But with both the S6s and the iOS, slightly larger changes um, during the finalized design and process and some minor changes while they're in early construction are also as a result of just looking over war experience reports coming in from Europe and going, right, well, we should make alterations for that. So you have this combination of being able to take advantage of war experience without actually being at war, the industry that allows you to build them in the numbers that you do, and the inbuilt advantages that they have from you know being able to be built with significant amounts of STS steel and as I mentioned before, things like the advanced fire control systems being distributed all across the ship, along with some really nice weapons like the 5-inch 38. Brian Stevens asks, I know quite a lot about Admiral Cochrane's exploits on half pay. Are there any other interesting stories I might follow up of similar exploits, even if no one else is likely to be like Cochrane? Well, there are actually a few Royal Navy officers who went off to do some rather interesting and impressive things, uh, one of which was Admiral Charles Napier. So he was, as the name suggests, a Royal Navy officer. But in the 1830s, he decided he was going to lead the Portuguese Navy, or at least uh, one element of it, specifically the side of Dom Pedro, a.k.a. the liberal side, versus um, Dom Miguel, who is now known as the usurper, Well, because, to be fair, he did usurp the throne, and B, he lost. So he gets to be called whatever the winning side likes. Nonetheless, um, Napier managed to lead a fleet consisting of a mighty three frigates and three auxiliaries against a an enemy fleet that had four full ships of the line, plus a couple of frigates and four auxiliaries. And yeah, that that's usually a very one-sided engagement. As I've said before, the general rule of thumb in the Age of Sail was that frigates do not fight ships of the line because it ends very, very badly for them. But uh, Admiral Napier, sensing that he had even more of a disparity in skill between his crews, which were mostly also British uh, sailors on half pay or had, who had come to the end of the commission of their ships, versus a very, very inexperienced um, Miguelite fleet, I think that's how you pronounce it, he just decided, you know what, stuff it, we're going to charge them. And he charged his little fleet uh, into hand-to-hand -hand combat, boarded and captured the entire enemy fleet, uh, apart from a couple, handful of auxiliaries who ran away. So, yeah, it turns out you can actually beat ships of the line with frigates. You just have to have one side with really competent crews and the other side with, frankly, hopeless crews. Somewhat earlier, a few decades earlier, you also had Sir Sidney Smith, who spent a, a while in the 1790s in the Royal Swedish Navy, helping Gustav III uh, rather handily trounce the, the Russians at the Battle of Svenskund. And those are just two of them. So uh, if you want more, I can provide you more, but there's two good ones to start with. Trevor Polasek asks, pick any ship you visited on the April 2022 US tour. Where would the shells land if its main battery was fired? Well, in that case, let's go with USS New Jersey's guns. The forward gun battery is elevated at 20 degrees, as confirmed by Ryan Szymanski in one of Battleship New Jersey's more recent videos. And so, well, we have range tables. Unfortunately, the easily accessible range tables measure the range out in blocks of yards and then give you the relevant elevation rather than giving you the elevation and then telling you how many yards that will go. So we know, that, for example, that at 16 degrees, the guns will fire 25,000 yards and at 21.1 .1 degrees, they'll fire 30,000 yards. Now, fortunately, if you plug the elevation values and the range values into a graph and you put a best fit line on it, you can chart along that graph roughly where 20, 20 degrees of elevation would go. And 20 degrees of elevation happens to give you, at least by my estimate, a range of 28,900 yards or 16.42 miles. And that would mean that it would be a very bad day to be driving, actually a hilarious enough, almost exactly at the junction of Knight Road and Norma Road, which is just to the north by northeast of Philadelphia, um, which, you know, there's going to be a few houses in the blast radius. It's got a patch of woods to the immediate northeast, so if the guns are very slightly off, that's why that'd be all right. It's about a tenth of a mile south of a couple of schools. Um, 
perhaps someone who's in the area knows roughly where I'm talking about. Um, it's apparently in an area called Penlin, just north of Ambler, or north of somewhere called Fort Washington, which, as I said, is all um, outside of the northern Philadelphia urban area. So yeah, that's where New Jersey's guns would land. Rebel Skvirl asks, Did Age of Sail Navies experiment with powder formulations at all, or was it all just standard black powder charges of varying sizes and weights? There wasn't so much experimentation with the gunpowder in the Age of Sail. It was a fairly settled matter um, to a certain extent. Now, there were some differences, primarily the quality of the ingredients and how finely they were processed. That could and did make a difference to how powerful everybody's powder was. And it seems that thanks to the adoption of some early industrialised processes, the British powder was a bit finer and therefore a bit better than their opponents. But in terms of the various major navies, um, some of the smaller navies did have some rather interesting ideas on exactly what the formulation of black powder should be. But the major navies all seem to have agreed on the saltpetre content as a percentage. But the British gunpowder, at least as far as the records seem to show, had a the very slightly higher by a percent to half a percent content of sulfur and a slightly lower by the same amount content of charcoal, whereas the French and Spanish powders seem to have had a slightly more charcoal content to them and slightly less sulfur. But we're talking, you know, a percent to half a percent difference. So it might make a difference. I mean, those of you who've worked with gunpowder considerably more than me might be able to um, say if that would make a substantial difference and if that difference would be more or less uh, covered or hidden by the the uh, fact that one is a slightly coarser powder and one's in a slightly finer powder. So I'll leave that up to those of you who can actually freely make and test their own powder. Although, please don't take this as a direct command to test gunpowder because, you know, that can end very badly as far as I'm aware. My mum's basement needs more windows asks. In the Patreon Dry Dock 241 Part 2, you showed a cross section of a turret belonging to a Scandinavian monitor. Danish monitor, actually. But yes, uh, this diagram clearly shows that the floor of the turret on which the gun sit slopes, with the end of the gun from which the projectile exits lower than the closed end. Was this done to help with recoil or for some other reason? Was this design widely used at the time? And when, if ever, did it stop being used? Well, here's the diagram in question. And the slope, to a certain degree, helps a little bit with recoil and with running the gun out again, although there are a number of turret examples with equally large guns where the turret it is has a flat floor. Um, the bigger issue with the this particular gun, and yes, this is actually a feature that's found quite commonly in a number of different gun turrets at this time, is the method of loading. Because if you look to the right-hand side of the picture there, you'll notice uh, between the numbers 14 and 30, a shell on a hoist with a little ramp going up. And you'll also notice that there, within the turret itself, underneath the gun or at the back of the gun, because this is a muzzle-loading gun, there is no other system of shell hoist, which is what the original question was about. So this slope is also there, partly, to allow the gun barrel, when it's at full depression, to meet the shell which it needs to be loaded with, which will be coming up from the, the side of the turret. In fact, it will be fed in um, via this little ramp. And then, as you can see uh, shown there, there's actually a chain fall which allows the shell to be hoisted up to the gun muzzle. Now, Obviously, the, the less work you have to do with a slow manual chain fall or possibly a motorized one, um, the better. So what will happen? The gun will fire, it will recoil backwards, and then the gun can, if you want, keep at that angle, but also could be depressed quite steeply, at which point when it's down, then up comes the shell and it would have to be spun around from the attitude it's at at the moment and then fed into the gun. 
this system would be evolved still further in a number of later ironclads, whereby the shell had now gotten too heavy for even this kind of system to work, but you're still using muzzle-loading guns, at which point you would have actual hydraulic rammers, and this would usually be in a fore-to-aft configuration rather than the port-starboard one that you can see here, and these hydraulic rammers would then ram the shell up the slope and into the gun barrel into the, via the muzzle and down into the base where obviously it could then be fired. Um, but of course, again, you don't really want to be ramming at too high an angle. Indeed, early hydraulic rams would have had problems doing so. And so every measure was taken to try and make sure that the guns could depress nicely enough um, and far enough down without compromising their ability to fire out their gun turret or barbette or whatever you were using. And so this sloped floor approach did still see use for a little while, either uh, both obviously after 1870, which is when this ironclad dates from, but a little bit before and reasonable bit after, basically until they stopped using muzzle-loading rifled guns in warships, which depended on which navy you were looking at, and also, you know, the size of the turret, the type of the gun, etc., etc., because for some guns, as I said, you could just have a level floor and it would be fine. Rob Smith asks... When the Washington Treaty was being drafted, was it assumed that there would be a successor treaty, the First London Treaty? And likewise, for the First London Treaty, was it done assuming there would be London too? Certainly not at the start. There are a few different areas in which modifications to the treaty are possible. For example, in Article 21, uh, it says if during the term of the present treaty, the requirements of the national security of any contracting power in respect of naval defence are, in the opinion of that power, materially affected by any change of circumstances, the contracting powers will, at the request of such power, meet in conference with a view to reconsideration of the provisions of the treaty and its amendment by mutual agreement. So that's if something changes, we can change the treaty with regards to a nation's need to defend itself. Um, so, I don't know, for example, I don't know, a resurgent Russian fleet attacks Japan, and Japan's like, oh, hang on a minute, we need more ships. Um, also in Article 21, uh, in view of the possible technical and scientific developments, the United States, after consultation with the other contracting powers, shall arrange for a conference of all the contracting powers, which shall convene as soon as possible after the expiration of eight years from the coming into force of the present treaty to consider what changes, if any, in the treaty may be necessary to meet such developments. So that's the clause that in some ways eventually led to the London 1 Naval Treaty, but that's not assuming that there will be a new treaty. That's just saying, you know, if by the end of the 1920s technical and scientific developments have occurred such that it might affect the way the treaty should be written, then we should all meet and agree to change it. But of course, if there isn't, then you don't have to. Um, and another thing to point out is Article 23, um, so which says, states in part, the present treaty shall remain in force until December 31st, 1936, and in case none of the contracting power shall have given notice two years before that date of its intention to terminate the treaty, it shall continue in force until the expiration of two years from the date on which the notice of termination shall be given by one of the contracting powers, whereupon the treaty shall terminate as regards all the contracting powers. Then it goes on to say how that will be done. So essentially what the treaty is saying is that it definitely is going to run until the end of 1936 unless somebody gives you two years notice that you're withdrawing from it. But if nobody does, then it's assumed that the treaty, at least from my reading, that the treaty will continue on a rolling basis unless and until somebody turns around and says, well, here's my two years notice, I'm out, at which point everybody gets released from it. So the Washington Treaty seems to have been envisioned originally as a 15-year treaty with provisions for modification, provisions for revisiting it after just over a decade. But there's no inbuilt assumption in the Washington Treaty that there will be a follow-on treaty, um, just, as I said, provisions made in case of radical changes. If nothing radical changes, then the treaty would, in theory, just roll on and on and on and on until somebody said they didn't want it to anymore. Matt Blom asks, referring to your nav video on naval engineering disasters, how not to design a ship, you have three British design disasters on the list, Mary Rose, Indefatigable, and the Courageous class. Which, in your opinion, was the greatest engineering disaster of those three, and which of the three should their design limitations have been the most obvious to the designers and thus the most avoidable? 
Well, it's definitely not Mary Rose. I'm going to give her not quite a pass, but a lot of forgiveness, mainly on the grounds that a primarily cannon armed vessel was still a very new concept in the West when she was modified. And she's a modified ship. She'd actually had a fairly successful career before that. And she even then, she was still something of a victim of circumstance. So although it is an engineering disaster, it's one where you can understand why they didn't necessarily see it coming, which leaves the infatical and courageous classes. Um, now, in terms of their design limit, I think but for both the greatest engineering disaster and the design limitations, the indefatigable class, especially indefatigable herself, has to take the, the, the cake. Um, the courageous class, their design flaws never killed anybody in any significant way. Obviously, courageous and glorious were sunk. That wasn't anything to do with their designers, whatever the heck they were. Um, obviously, converted into aircraft carriers by the time they were sunk. So... Yeah, that's the engineering disaster in terms of lives lost. The indefatigable obviously took the most people, well, people with her. Um, and it's escalated by the other bit, which is the design limitations should have been the most obvious and thus the most avoidable. This is why I basically put indefatigable at the top of the list in that video and why I was so angry about it and to a certain extent still am. Because as I pointed out in the video, you know, we're in the era of scientific design, we're in the era of calculated design, and the indefatigables are the follow-ons to the invincibles. By the stage they are designing the indefatigables, they know what the German Navy is capable of. They know what they are now likely to face. The era of the invincibles, when they are the only battle cruisers around and therefore can pretty much operate unchallenged and only have to worry about armoured cruiser guns. By the time the indefatigables are being decided upon, that is over. So you have to take that into consideration if you are the designer. Now, once you do that, repeat invincibles, I mean, they're not particularly well armoured against 11-inch gunfire, but at least repeats of the existing design would have been somewhat forgivable if you made an economic argument for it. You know, we can really quickly build another three Invincibles, whereas if we want to build something that's better, uh, Admiral Fisher wanted to build basically a prototype Lion, then that might take longer, or we might only get two instead of three. You know, it's not a brilliant argument, but it's an argument that has a certain degree of logic to it. Whereas with the Indefatigables, okay, the cross-deck firing of P&Q turrets wasn't brilliant on the Invincibles, and trying to fix that is quite useful. However, and this is the big thing that you know I keep circling back to with the Indefatigables, you're not particularly well armoured. Okay, we may be acknowledging that 6-inch armour is not going to help if you're going to face off against something like Von der Tan. Fine. But the original role of the battle cruiser was to kill the armoured cruiser, and the point of having a big slab of six-inch armour across pretty much all the vital parts of the ship was to keep out armoured cruiser gunfire at reasonable battle ranges, and then you thin down the armour over A and X to four inches. Which now means you have an incredibly expensive piñata, because... Armoured cruiser gunfire, and you're probably going to be fighting armoured cruisers, which now are going to have an equal or greater broadside for the last generation of armoured cruisers. And because they have smaller guns, they're going to be firing faster, which means statistically they're going to be hitting you more than you hit them. And with the Invincibles, that doesn't matter because your arm will protect you. And even with the Indefatigables, it does matter because your armour won't protect you over half of your magazines. Yeah, it, it would not have taken a rocket scientist to see that one coming. Um, and that, in part, resulted in the loss of over a thousand lives. Now, OK, granted, Invincible went the same way. But the thing is, Invincible went up like that for a variety of reasons. But, you know, e e even if. Invincible had taken a direct hit to the magazines, which she almost certainly didn't. But even if she had taken a direct hit to the magazines from an 11-inch shell, which is theoretically possible with 6-inch armour, 
at least she would have had to have been facing off against another battle cruiser. Whereas with Indefatigable, you could have got that result if the Germans had stuck one of their surviving armoured cruisers, at least some of the later ones, in the battle line. You know, the Indefatigables, especially Indefatigable herself, because Australia and New Zealand had 5-inch armour upgraded for A and X um, belt armour. Yeah, Indefatigable was at risk of against anything that had you know more than a 5.9 inch gun and even the 5.9 inch gun might have been a threat at closer ranges which for something that big and that expensive with that many men on is pretty much an unforgivable mistake to make f19a ghost rider asks hypothetically would the german surface raiders of early world war ii have been more effective or caused more damage if they had completely ignored prize rules from the outset of the war, i.e. they didn't let the crew evacuate and just blasted the merchants with Allied Nations flags on sight, assuming they got into range. It seems to me that adhering to the proper conduct of commerce raiding really hindered the actual practice of it. I think yes and no. The thing you've got to remember with the quote-unquote proper conduct of commerce raiding, i.e. cruiser rule warfare, is that it was codified in the era before radio. It, there's not a huge amount different between cruiser rules warfare as theoretically practiced, at least in parts of World War One and Two, and similar rules of action and engagement for attacking enemy merchant vessels in Nelson's period. And as a result various technologies don't get really thought of one of which being radio because if you you know signal to the enemy ship by shooting across its bow or something look i have you at my mercy you need to haul over we'll let everybody go but your ships aren't going to be sent to the bottom etc etc in the age of sail and even in the age of steam and even in the age of iron that's perfectly viable because there's nothing that ship can do to call for help. You know, they yeah, they can send put signal flags up and so on and so forth, but you can see as far as they can, and if nobody is on the on the horizon or closer, no one's gonna see their call for help, which is fine. But when you get into the era where radios are a thing, well, they can radio for help and that can travel a very long way and people can hear it and come in and stop you, which makes that means that you have to either run away or you finish them off, but then you have to leave the area because it's very likely enemy warships will come sniffing. So from a purely utilitarian point of view, yes, conducting commerce raiding, adhering to the proper rules does hinder the actual practice of commerce raiding. Uh, Unless, of course, you have a radio jammer on board that's powerful enough to blanket the civilian radio at however many miles away you are. But, well, that's not really a thing for World War One or World War Two for the most part. You could put some impromptu jamming, and especially there were dedicated jammers in World War Two. But as far as I'm aware, um, nobody ever installed a dedicated, professionally designed radio jammer on a Hilfskreuzer. <laughs> You can, as I said, you can flood the frequencies yourself, but that's also a bit of a giveaway because everyone's going to go, hmm, I wonder why this frequency over in that direction is suddenly flooded with a bunch of static. Maybe we should go and investigate. <laughs> the flip side is that if they had just ignored all that and gone you know, full unrestricted warfare mode, in the short term, yes, that would have actually made them considerably more effective as commerce raiders. But in the mid to long term, it would have made them far less effective because a if they start ignoring the rules of warfare being able to call into neutral ports or being able to coal or receive oil depending on which war you're looking at um and which ship for that matter you know getting all of that from neutrals is going to become considerably more difficult if you start getting a reputation as a merciless killer and you're not going to be able to get everybody, not unless you want to escalate to complete war crimes o'clock. You know, there are going to be survivors that they will eventually get word out of what you're doing and people will start to turn against you. Also, if there's word out that, you know, there's this ship around that is just mercilessly slaughtering everything in sight, your prey is much, much, much more likely to suddenly 
disappear off into safe ports and it's going to invite considerably increased retribution from your opponent. So you, know, you might have a few months of relatively increased effectiveness followed by a very short and very sharp and horrible end. Nicholas Ressar asks, what determines barbette size? Weight of the guns and the turret? The physical dimensions of the turret? Or some secret third thing? It's usually the dimensions of the turret, and hence the turret ring, which are in turn determined by the layout of the turret. So does the turret have one gun, two guns, three guns, four guns? How are those guns laid out? Are they Italian style, really, really close together? Are they spread out massively because you're a bit of an idiot and you have horizontal sliding breech blocks on 15-inch guns? Are they vaguely re reasonably spaced out because you're a little bit more sensible and you have interrupted screw breech blocks? How much space do you need for elevation mechanisms? Because how high can your guns elevate? How big are the gun pits? You know, how, are you going to have sloped uh, turret face armor? Are you going to have a slab-sided turret face? Is the rest of the turret going to have rounded armor? Or is it, again, a little bit more slab-sided? All of these things will affect the overall size of the turret, the dimensions. And once you have those dimensions, well, obviously the barbette has to... well the turret ring has to fit within the scope of the turret, and then the barbette has to fit just around that turret ring. You can get a little bit of overlap as a result, like with the King George V's, but broadly speaking, you don't want to make the barbette any bigger than it necessarily has to be. So you know, the positioning and number and type of the shell and charge hoists, for example, will also have an effect, because all of that needs to come up inside the barbette, and therefore if you have, like you can see here, a triple turret, that barbette needs to be wide enough for at least three sets of ammunition hoists, apart from anything else. Whilst the overall weight of the gun and turret combo does have a small effect, realistically speaking, especially when you consider how thick the barbettes are, form follows function. If your gun turret is really big, and therefore probably also weighs a fair bit, the barbette's going to be fairly big and fairly thick as well, which means that the weight, unless something's gone really, really weirdly wrong, is not really going to be that much of a factor. Meatward asks, In the records for Yamato and Musashi on John Parshall's Combined Fleet website, there are a number of AP bomb hits noted that penetrate boiler rooms or hold the ship below the waterline and cause flooding. Is it common for AP bombs to penetrate so deep into a ship? aside from tool boys, and does it have to penetrate somewhere such as a funnel in order to do so? Has a bomb alone ever caused a ship to sink from flooding? It really depends on the AP bomb and how it's dropped, um, and obviously the armour of the target, but that's usually somewhat secondary. I mean, if you're going to drop a 250 or 500 pound AP bomb against a target that has, you know, six plus inches of deck armor. So if it, let, let's construct two separate scenarios, kind of a best case and a worst case. So worst case scenario, or reasonable worst case, you drop a 500 pound AP bomb on a target that's got six to seven inches of deck armor and you release it a little bit low and maybe at a 20, 25 degree off perpendicular angle. That's just going to hit the deck armor, wherever that happens to be on the ship. It's not going to penetrate. It's just going to explode, and that's pretty much the end of it. But most ships, not all, but most, have their deck armor relatively low in the ship, so even that explosion is going to still you know, go a reasonable way through the ship. Conversely, if you're talking about maybe an older ship, you might have three or four inches of deck armor, and you drop the bomb, and maybe it's a thousand pound or even a sixteen hundred pound AP bomb, or even a two thousand two hundred pounder if you're the Germans, and you drop that from a fair distance up, and so it gains a lot of speed on the way down, and you manage to hit. Yeah, that's going to go through, and that's going to go through a fair bit because most AP bombs had a delayed action fuse that would activate when they hit something really solid, like deck armor. So the bomb's only actually going to, in theory, start counting off when it should explode once it penetrates that deck armor. And at the speed that that thing's going to be traveling, it's going to end up very deep in the ship before it goes off. And obviously, in the case of something like Fritz X, it can even go straight through the ship and out the bottom before exploding. Now, in terms 
of does it have to penetrate somewhere such as a funnel to do so? No, it just has to be heavy enough and dropped from high enough to penetrate the deck armor. And then, as I said, it will go fairly deep into the ship. Has a bomb ever caused a ship to sink from flooding on its own? Yes, but somewhat rarely, because when you drop bombs and they manage to penetrate deep into a ship's vitals, they tend to set off all sorts of interesting things, whether that just be fires or you know, crippling the machinery or full-on explosions or a combination of the three, especially if you manage to hit magazines. So you can get ships that were hit and sunk purely by bombs. Hermes is a good example. As you can see here, Arizona is another very famous example. But in a lot of cases where you get bomb hits being responsible for sinking ships, it's not necessarily the bomb itself that directly caused the ship to sink, but the secondary effects of that bomb. You know, in Hermes' case, you just got hit by lots of them. Um, but as you can see, also set on fire. Arizona's case, obviously, there was a magazine explosion, which then touched off the rest of the main magazine, and you know, the rest is history. But when you get down to smaller ships, then yes, some smaller ships could just be sunk outright by bomb hits. Destroyers especially um, were quite vulnerable to being hit by relatively large bombs that would just you know, blow an end off or break the ship in half just through sheer explosive power without having to touch off a magazine. But as ships get bigger and bigger, and therefore, thanks to Square Cube Law, exponentially more better able to resist a single point explosion, you rely more and more on either multiple hits or multiple hits that also happen to set off some kind of secondary effect. Marlin Stout asks, in the video on British ironclad development, you mentioned the use of rubber instead of wood as a backing material for ship's armour, and that this was considered and possibly experimented with. Was this vulcanised rubber that was considered or not? And if not, would vulcanised rubber be a good material for the purpose? What were the advantages and disadvantages of vulcanized rubber versus wood as armor backing for warships B? I don't believe that they were using vulcanized rubber. I base that mostly on the, a, a very ex extensive treatise from the period, which goes over a whole slew of different armor schemes, including ones backed by rubber. And they are actually very careful in the treaties. Most of the time they refer to India rubber, but they are very careful to say this is vulcanized India rubber where it merits it. And otherwise they just call it India rubber, which would make me think when they just call it India rubber, it's a non-vulcanized type because they also refer to the use of rubber in washers and all sorts of other things as well as uh, armor backing. The main idea behind rubber as opposed to timber or rubber as well as timber as a backing was that, I mean, obviously rubber has a certain amount of shock absorbance capability, but they had noticed, at least on a smaller scale, the fact that with regular rubber sheeting, if you shot it with something, you would essentially tear through it. But once the projectile had passed through, the rubber would mostly, if not entirely, just kind of reseal itself behind. You might still have a tear in it, but that would be a relatively negligible thing compared to the hole that would be left in wood. And so the idea was that if you used the rubber either to complement or instead of wood, then if a shell did make it through the iron armour that it was backing, instead of having a very large breach, you would just have effectively a near enough self-sealing hole or very minimal amounts of um, actual through damage, which would then make it less likely that you take on water. There were even a few slightly outlandish ideas in the very early stages of armor development of just having big, thick sheets of rubber instead of iron um, on the basis that they might repel smaller grade gunfire at like you know, 18 pounder or something. And the big ones, again, they'd pass through, but they'd pass through without splinters and self-healing the problem was that it turned out actually rubber at least the type they were using didn't have anywhere near the same resistive capacities of wood so it would let through more shots than wood might otherwise stop and at the scale that you're talking about so 68 pound 110 pounder or bigger shot that shot would still take chunks out of it now in terms of wood vulcanized rubber have been better I 
don't think so. It might have had slightly greater damage resistance capabilities, but the main reason, as we just said, for trying to experiment with rubber was this self-healing property. And one of the slight downsides of vulcanized rubber is that although it is a lot harder, when you do blow through it, which inevitably a big gun like this would, it's much more susceptible to having big chunks taken with whatever has hit it. And that basically circumvents the whole point of trying it with um, rubber armor. So the reason why you might be wondering why this paddle wheeled abomination of an ironclad has been gracing your screens. This is USS Lafayette. And at one stage she had experimental armor, which was I think two and a half inches of iron with two inches of rubber backing. Turned out it didn't work very well. Chief Eyeroll asks, can you briefly recount the battle of the Beta or Duisburg convoy in November 1941? What results came from this battle and how was it viewed by the Axis and the British? So this battle takes place towards the end of 1941 by in the Mediterranean. By this point, obviously, you have the Africa Corps as well as the Italian forces in North Africa fighting the Eighth Army, and they're in desperate need of supplies. And the Italians, together with some German help, put together a rather large convoy. Not large as in total number of merchant ships, but rather large in terms of what kind of supplies they're carrying. Um, briefly, to sum it up, there's something approaching almost 400 vehicles. Um, there's about 35,000 tons of ammunition. And then there's a whole ton of fuel. I mean, there's fuel in multiple different merchant ships, but just the two tankers that are with the convoy alone carry about 17,000 tons of fuel. So this is a huge potential reinforcement for Axis war efforts in North Africa. And, you know, given that they're doing a, what's relatively speaking a short convoy hop across from the southern part of Italy to the northern part of Africa... There's quite an escort. There's a total of 10 destroyers and the two Trento-class heavy cruisers, with four of those destroyers being placed with the Trentos, which are on a kind of the more distant escort, and six destroyers running in close escort, which is a relatively common way of running convoy escort formations at this point. Um, not so much necessarily in the Mediterranean, but quite often with our allied convoys, especially Arctic convoys, you'll find a closer escort of smaller ships and a more discontent escort made up of heavier vessels. And the main reason for such an heavy escort was the fact that recently the Royal Navy had reinstituted Force K based in Malta, surface raiding force, and had been making a bit of a mess of Axis convoys. Now, Force K was indeed dispatched to intercept the convoy with the grand total of two Arethusa class light cruisers. That's the two, that's the ones with uh, six six inch guns and a pair of destroyers. So, not exactly overwhelming firepower compared to the total escort force that the Axis convoy has. But the Italian convoy commander seems to have underestimated the British ability to fight at night using radar. And so the British followed pretty much the same rule book that they had at Matapan, which, bear in mind, had been at the start of the year in March 1941. This is now November 1941. But the British tactics are still pretty much the same. Um, lock on to the targets and start closing and closing and keep on closing, keeping all of your guns bearing on your targets and get as close as humanly possible until the moment you see them twitch. And as soon as you see them twitch, which is an indication that they've spotted something or intercepted something, that's when you open fire, because now you have them basically dead to rights at point-blank range, which maximizes your chances of a quick and easy kill. They were ordered to target the nearest convoy escorts first. If the others showed up, then so be it. But, you know, take out the escorts that are nearest you first, then take out the convoy. And so at a range of well under 6,000 yards, they open fire. The distant escort was on the other side of the convoy, and so the destroyers that were on the side of the convoy that was attacked were pretty quickly savaged and either forced to fall back or mortally wounded in one destroyer's case, which then meant that the British ships were able to open fire on the convoy. They got rid of, they actually managed to sink every single merchant ship. By the point they were finishing off the merchant ships, the distant escort and the destroyers from the other side of the convoy managed to arrive. 
in the area initially because they hadn't anticipated the British could attack so easily at night. They thought they were under night attack by aircraft, which, you know, they got, for those who occasionally ask, oh, did the British ever attack things at night with aircraft? Yes, yes, they did quite a lot using radar equipped aircraft. And this is what the Italians thought was going on. But of course, it wasn't. It was ships. Um, once they realized it was British ships and they fired star shell and they spotted the British ships, they finally started to engage. But by that point, the British just went, well, you know, we were here to kill the convoy. We've killed the convoy. We have no particular interest in uh, fighting, you know, two light cruisers and two destroyers versus two heavy cruisers and over half a dozen destroyers. So we're just going to leave now and did. And that left the Italians having to just poke around looking for survivors from the merchant ships and from the destroyer that had been sunk and the destroyers that had been badly damaged. So it was a quite important victory. It completely denied all those supplies to the Axis forces, which obviously didn't help the situation in North Africa for the Axis. But it also had significant long-term effects. It drove something of a wedge between the Germans and the Italians. The Germans thought the Italians didn't know how to fight at sea. The Italians obviously resented that. And it meant that, you know, having seen that even a considerable escort could be picked off at night by the British, the Italians were forced to switch tactics again to a much less efficient system of trying to send out individual ships or pairs of ships uh, in a kind of a scattershot approach on the basis that theoretically whatever magic the British are using to detect our convoys, be it probably air reconnaissance in their opinion, it can't find all of them. Of course, the British are actually at that point reading Italian code, so yes, they could, which just made things even worse um, for the Italians, because obviously an unescorted or nearly unescorted pair of ships is much easier to take out than a convoy like this, which requires a fair bit of clever thinking to get rid of. And so the overall supply situation to the Axis was massively disrupted for quite a considerable period of time over the winter of 1941 and into 1942. Synchro Score asks, in your video on the development history of the Alaska class, at seven minutes in, there's a picture of a 10-inch turret on an American armored cruiser. There are objects fitted to the barrels and another device suspended from a boom on the turret roof. Do you know what this contraption is and what it's for? It looks to me like maybe some kind of target practice simulator or guns like calibration rig. Yes, this is in fact called a dotter. So this is practice dotter drill during gunnery practice. Now, the way this works is actually quite interesting. It's invented by Percy Scott of the Royal Navy. And in this photo, this is on USS Washington in circa 1910 or just thereafter. So it's had time to disseminate. Now, the idea of this is that on the bit that's attached to this boom that's attached to the turret, you can see these three things hanging down. And these correspond to the three range finding scopes, which you can see in the three little hoods on top of the turret. So each each station has its own um, hood. And as you can see, two of them are have been used. The other one in the middle has not as of yet. Now, in each of those frames is a piece of card. And in each of those cards, they, on each of the cards, there is the silhouette of a ship. Now, this whole mechanism uh, will be moved uh, up and down, left and right, etc., etc., to simulate the movement of a vessel, which is obviously represented on the card. The spotter, or the rangefinder officer, or whatever you want to call them, he has to try and keep his scope centred on the target. And then whenever he wants to, he will press a uh, a button or a trigger or whatever it, mechanism it is that he has that can simulate or would, would actually fire the main guns. And that's attached to a solenoid, which would then plunge forward with a dart or a pencil or something attached, which would then poke a hole in the card. So this is simulating him saying, right, I think the gun is aimed or my spotting scope, which is therefore aiming the gun, is attached in real life, is attached to this piece of, uh, uh, sorry, is aiming correctly at the target and the solenoid goes forward and goes, right, well, this is roughly where you would have hit. And there'll be target marks on the card to indicate, you know, were you acceptably within accuracy or not? Um, bearing in mind, obviously, that the target's constantly moving. So it's a way for the gun crew to practice aiming and firing their guns without actually having to 
aim and fire their guns for real and expend ammo and put wear on the barrels, etc., etc. By this stage, I suspect things are a little bit more advanced than the original version because this is a decade plus um, after they've the Dotter was first introduced. So there's probably some kind of clockwork or electro other electromechanical system which is helping to simulate more accurate motion. So and that and I say that's why there's all these holes in them. And that's probably something to do with the mechanism with these two sort of hooded mechanisms that are attached to the gun barrels themselves. Jim Smitty asks, been listening to older Bilge Prompts podcasts. Before I listened to one of the more recent ones, I hadn't heard of the final fate of USS Data, i.e. with her classified papers being taken by the Japanese. How did the Japanese make use of this mess of information? Do you believe that this information helped the Japanese in pulling off the attacks on Franklin and Bunker Hill? Uh, what else did this information help the Japanese achieve in the closing days of the Pacific War? So it's not ultimately known exactly what the Japanese managed to make of what they captured from USS Data in terms of what the overall impact was, what was everything they learned. But it seems almost certain that what they did learn specifically was about the US Type 3 Identification Friend or Foe or IFF system and how to utilize it, monitor it, and exploit it to their own benefit um, in a number of different ways because they got the antenna, they probably got the documents as well. We know from the reports from Data's captain that some of the classified and confidential documents aboard were not destroyed because he makes reference in his initial report saying the stuff we couldn't destroy, I'm going to you know, send in a separate document, which doesn't seem to be easily accessible. Um, and he also mentions that there's a lot of smoke caused by the burning of the documents they think they did manage to destroy. And as anyone who's had to burn large numbers of papers can tell you, and I can tell you from personal experience as well, it's actually quite difficult to get large amounts of paper to burn thoroughly. You can chuck a book or a wadge of documents, even loose paper, into a fire that's going pretty well, and it'll look burned. You know, the outer pages, the edges of the pages and the top and bottom pages will crisp up and blacken and burn away pretty nice and easy. And in a big pile of ash, it might look like it's all burned away. But in actual fact, if it's a big wedge of papers, what's usually happened is the outer pages and the outer edges of the inner pages have burnt, but then they form this protective layer which insulates the internal pages. And so 80 plus percent of that wedge of paper will actually survive for quite a while. So then if someone comes along, you see, oh, well, there's a big pile of paper ash, but you shift, sift it around. Oh, look, there's a bunch of actual readable documentation here. And obviously we don't know exactly how much that happened to Data's documentation. Um, it turns out that the best way to do it is you actually have to either rip the paper up into basically playing card or smaller fragments, which means that and as they burn and curl, they're small enough that as they curl up, they reveal enough of the underlying layer that that then burns and so on and so forth. Or you have to scrunch each bit up individually, sheet by sheet or a couple of sheets at a time and chuck it in, which is a long and laborious process that you're not necessarily going to do when you're in the middle of abandoning a submarine. Anyway, the upshot of all of that is that we know the Japanese got their hands on the IFF antenna that Data had, and they very likely got their hands on documentation about radar and the IFF antenna, which allowed them to then work out a number of different things. Because once you know how the US IFF system works and you know it's omnidirectional, that means you can look out for those signals. So you can use that to either work out where the American aircraft are and then make sure that your aircraft aren't there. So if you're heading to attack a known enemy formation, you can go, oh, well, the enemy CAP is over here. So I'm going to go over here instead and avoid them. Now, of course, the problem with that is that you do still risk being picked up by radar, which they may then vector the, the cap onto you. An alternative is that you can go, OK, well, this section of the radar screen is absolutely lousy with returns because you've got the returns of the actual aircraft that are there plus the IFF returns. It's all very, very busy. So if I can sneak an aircraft in there and sort of fly along with, not obviously in formation with, but in the same vicinity as a stream of returning US aircraft, 
it's very unlikely that anyone's going to notice one extra blip or spike, depending on whether you're using the older style oscilloscope screens or the PPI screens, that isn't quite returning an IFF system. And we know that they use this quite a lot to their advantage. So, you know, if there's a stream of US aircraft returning to their carriers and they're flying at, let's say, arbitrarily 10,000 feet, the cloud layer at 12,000 feet, well, you can then vector via radio uh, Japanese aircraft on the same course at, say, 13,000 feet, just above the clouds, where he's very unlikely to be spotted, but where the US radar is going to have an absolute devil of a time working out that he's there at all. And then the last way is you can actually try and jury-rig an IFF system to your aircraft. So you can pretend, as a Japanese aircraft, to be a US aircraft. And this seems to have been done at least occasionally, uh, because there's a number of reports from US Navy and US Marine Corps radar operators of them eventually visually identifying a Japanese aircraft, but looking on the radar and going, this, air this aircraft is returning a US IFF signal. So you know, there's th there's three ways you can exploit things um, or a co some combination thereof. And it seems to show through also in terms of, you know, Japanese effectiveness because you have uh, the Battle of uh, the Philippine Sea, okay, the Great Marianas Turkey shoot, and in the that's obviously mid 1944, and the Japanese don't really seem to have any idea how the US radar system works. Then you have the loss of the data, and then the, you know, a, a month or two's grace for the Japanese to work out what they've got. And then magically out of nowhere, at the end of November 1944, suddenly Japanese aircraft, and this is, you see a transition, I mean, you still get mass kamikaze attacks and mass attempts at torpedo and dive bomber strikes and so forth, but suddenly there's this shift in some of the Japanese tactics away from mass stra uh, attack over to lone aircraft or pairs of aircraft magically seeming to appear out of nowhere. And on the same day, 25th of November 1944, Essex, Intrepid, Hancock and Cabo, so three Essex class and a Independence class, are all suddenly hit by Japanese aircraft that have magically sneaked through every single layer of defence that the US has. And, well, on top of that, you have, you know, within less than a month of that happening, obviously somebody in the US has figured out exactly what's happened and you have a new radar picket system introduced where returning US aircraft streams are directed over specific radar picket destroyers who then visually verify that, yes, this is in fact a uh, American aircraft. Now, ostensibly publicly, this is sold as a anti-kamikaze measure, but it's a very suspicious set of timings. You know, it's, I think, yes, it may well have been an anti-kamikaze measure, but I think it's also a case of someone on the US side had figured out that someone on the Japanese side had figured out how to exploit the IFF Mark III and had then introduced a counter to the counter. Because, you know, you can trail as many US aircraft streams as you like, but you still have a big red roundel and you're a very distinctive other kind of aircraft. So a visual inspection makes it easier to go, hmm, OK, you're, you're not a, an American aircraft. Now, as, as that relates to specifically the attacks on uh, Franklin and Bunker Hill, it's entirely possible, especially with uh, Franklin, that they were using some form of this exploit and or exploiting other things, like I mentioned in the video on Franklin, about the fact that US carriers, want, when they're spotting airstrikes on their decks, they can't really use their own radar to look to port, which they then rely on their escorts to do for them. And... There's also, you know, other things that the Japanese could use to exp um, exp use this information to exploit. So things like the attack on USS Pennsylvania by the dying days of the war. Again, magical lone bomber appearing out of nowhere. This seems to be a par for the course for the Japanese exploitation of the assets that they'd captured from data and then reverse engineered US systems. Which shows you just how dangerous things can be because you can have this incredibly advanced electronic system... But if your enemy gets hold of a version and figures out how to exploit it, they can then pretend to be you. And yeah, that's when you get Magical Judy showing up out of the sky. Michael Griffith asks, Would skip bombing have had any effect on warships bigger than a destroyer? 
A Marine B-25 bomber with a nose full of 50 cal takes all the fun out of open AA positions, but will bombs let water into the cruisers or bigger warships? Was any thought given to specialised munitions for this? Yes, skip bombing could have had a fairly dramatic effect on targets like cruisers and battleships. Now, granted, skip bombing specifically was using general purpose bombs, so if you drop them against a battleship and or something with fairly substantial armour and you hit it on the armour, there's a relatively decent chance it would withstand the impact because you're talking about something without an AP nose and probably travelling slower than an incoming shell and weighing somewhat less than a battleship shell as well. But if you hit forward or aft of the main belt armour, you'd still punch a nice hole and blow a big hole in the side, which would cause a lot of water to come in. It might skip over the armour and penetrate above that and then do a bunch of damage. I mean, not necessarily fatal damage, but it would certainly mess the target up quite badly. And then, of course, on top of that, I mean, this is assuming if you're using a £1,000 general purpose bomb. If you're using a £500 general purpose bomb, you're probably going to have less than spectacular results against a major ship. Um, but whilst you could still have some considerable impact um, with the, the general purpose bomb, there was specialised munitions developed for it, specifically uh, called Highball, which was a development of, and slight size reduction, thankfully, of the bouncing bombs, uh, upkeep bombs, which were used by 617 Squadron against the Myrna, Eda, and Sorp dams. And Highball resembles, for the best will in the world, a sort of 1,200-pound-ish metal golf ball, which has a very thick casing, obviously being spherical, mostly spherical, um, doesn't have an issue which angle it hits the water, which obviously GP bombs, if they hit nose first or their belly out, could have some problems. Um, and was designed to hit really, really hard. And in fact, they tested them against Corbet and Malaya. And they found that, yes, they will quite happily punch into a ship's side. And then, well, 600 pounds of explosive detonating inside a ship. Not not a good thing. Not a good thing at all. Um, so, yes, you would have similar-ish effects with a thousand pound general purpose bomb. But the highball bombs, even though they were never used in actual combat, if they had been used they would have been slightly easier to use and would have hit somewhat harder, so it would have been more effective against ships with significant armoured sides. Vokir asks, In recent years, there have been plenty of stories of navies and various other armed branches around the world failing to meet recruitment targets. Is there any other peacetime period in history where crew acquisition and retention was such a persistent issue? Yes, this is unfortunately a rather recurringly persistent issue in navies across the world. Um, the Royal Navy offers perhaps the best example of the rises and peaks and falls and so forth of this issue because it has, theoretically at least, the capability for most of the period the channel covers to pay for everybody and keep them all happy and fed and watered and in accommodation and therefore you shouldn't have a problem meeting recruitment targets. Whereas when you look at other navies, they're overall size waxes and wanes, the overall state of the economy of their country waxes and wanes, so it's a little harder to unpick the country's broke from the Navy specifically not really being able to meet its recruitment targets because it doesn't have any money to pay anyone. Um, so looking at the Royal Navy, one of the issues that you will see, and actually you see across quite a number of other navies as well, is the government really likes trying to fix sailors' wages which doesn't really work with such a little thing called inflation. So what tends to happen is uh, people go, okay, well, a sailor is supposed to risk his life for king and country or queen and country, depending on the time period. And this reserve deserves some additional recognition. So he should be paid relatively well. And eventually parliament or whatever, the king's court, whoever, whatever country, a legislative body in question will be persuaded that yes they should actually stump up the cash because you know otherwise their navy might turn on them and so an act will be passed and they will say okay right well the then people in the sailors in the navy will get paid x and x is a relatively decent amount and suddenly you know especially in peacetime when all you have to do is just sail a ship around occasionally and you get paid decent wages for it that's not fairly difficult to keep um the crew but 
As time goes on, inflation makes that money worth less and less. But the Act of Parliament, in this case for the Royal Navy, says that you're paid so many pence a day, and that's it. And so the value of your salary for or your wage falls from a little bit better than average to average to below average to well below average to the point where you're having to look for additional sources of income just to keep your head above water, metaphorically speaking. And as that happens, the Navy becomes less and less of an attractive option for people to be in. And eventually you get people obviously on long service contracts and so forth, and you will eventually get mutinies. And then usually what tends to happen in the Royal Navy is there'll be a series of mutinies over pay conditions, food, most of which has also slipped because a lot of their those provisions are also fixed expenses set by Parliament you know, 50, 60, 100 years earlier and have also suffered from inflation. And there'll be a big outcry and eventually the Parliament will be persuaded, yes, in fact, you do actually occasionally have to increase sailors' pay so their pay will go up and then all of a sudden it'll be above average again, everyone will be happy and repeat the process. <laughs> and so it goes on like this for quite a while, pretty much almost the entire history that time period that the channel covers. Plus, you will occasionally get attempts to cut pay, believe it or not, during wartime on the argument that, ah, oh, but sailors can make up a lot of money by capturing prizes. And so because they have this prospect of potentially getting a lot of money, we don't have to pay them as much day to day. Yeah, you can imagine how well that goes down most of the time. Fortunately, whoever suggested that in Parliament is taken out the back and quietly beaten with sticks by you know, the more sensible members of Parliament who would point out that if you write to a bunch of people who are currently heavily armed and engaged in keeping an enemy away from invading you and say, well, we're going to cut your pay because we think you can go and find your own money, they may just go and find their own money from the other side by working for them. Stephen K. Jensen asks, I've wondered about how visible or distinct splashes from shells with dye packs were. Are there any good colour photos of them? Uh, the few that I've seen all seem to have been colourised after the fact. There aren't that many, unfortunately. Colour photography at the time of dyed shells being used was very much in its infancy, and it was very difficult to get decent colour photos, especially at long ranges. They basically needed slightly too long an exposure time for something like an instant snapshot that you'd need from a shell splash. Now, of course, things were improving over time. Towards the mid to late 1930s, colour photography became a lot more responsive. But as far as I'm aware, there are very, 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 very few pictures out there at all of coloured shell splashes in colour. Um, now, we know from reports that they were very visible and distinct in real life. You know, if um, there's reports from the fleet problems where three or four ships with different coloured dye packs all fired. This is from the mid-1920s. And even if, you know, a dozen shells all landed in roughly the same place, people go, oh yeah, that's a green one, that's a yellow one, that's a red one from miles away. That that So they definitely worked. They were very distinct. I am aware that they're in, I think, for the fleet problem that was held in 1936 and in 1937, the US Navy was using um, coloured dyes in their in some of the shells, and this was being filmed, so there is colour film of those shell splashes coming up somewhere, but I don't know exactly where that is in the US National Archive system. Uh, maybe if someone else does, they can point us to the ID marker and we can all go and have a look. J Mace asks, I've read that during the American Civil War, the Russians deployed several warships to American ports, and I was interested. I was wondering if you could talk about why they were there, if they were ever deployed in combat or almost ended up in combat, and are there any other cases of a country at peace stationing warships in a country at war? Yep, uh, I can talk about that. Here they are. Um, six of them. <laughs> six Russian ships showed up on the US East Coast, as you can tell from the depiction, although this is a woodcut, it is a depiction of the ships in question. They're basically all frigates, or near enough as makes no difference. And they were sent to support the Union side of the American Civil War. Uh, they were not deployed in combat against the Confederacy uh, because Russia didn't want to get actually deep down and dirty involved in the American Civil War. But they were sent there as an expression of support for the Union, essentially as a way of sticking two fingers up at Britain. Because remember, this is 
uh, the early 1860s, Russia's just come off the back of the Crimean War with France and Britain, which, you know, for some understandable reasons, they were not particularly great fans of Britain and France at that stage. And there was a public perception that Britain was sympathetic to the Confederacy, which was partially accurate, I guess, um, in as much as there was a, uh, I would say, a fair degree of sympathy for the Confederacy in the upper echelons of British society, particularly British industrialist circles. Uh, whereas the British populace, the general public, tended to be much more in favour of the Union. Um, and, but for whatever reason, you know, Russia went, ah, we, we think the British support the Confederacy. Therefore, by, you know, the enemy of my enemy is my friend, we like the Union. So to show support for the Union and to vaguely, I suppose, try and deter anyone from interfering, not that the Russian fleet had managed to deter much in the Crimean War immediately before, but never mind, they sent a bunch of uh, their longer range ships to go and say hi to the Americans and say, hi, look, you, um, Abraham Lincoln and the Union, we support you and uh, we back your cause and now we will sit in harbour and be very friendly with you and then we will eventually go home. For anyone who's interested, they basically hung around New York Harbour until early 1864 before leaving, um, although some of the Russian sailors who died whilst they were on deployment to New York are actually buried nearby. 22NF2 asks, when did aircraft carriers start to be considered as capital ships? Did this shift come post-war, or did this start towards the end of World War II? It's a little difficult to pinpoint, and it seems to have happened at different times in different navies. And I think I think it's, it's rather difficult, even within specific navies, to say, all right, as of X date, carriers were now regarded as capital ships, as opposed to before X date when they were regarded as some form of ancillary. I think in the US Navy, as you probably saw through the fleet problems videos, there was a growing trend amongst some admirals to view carriers as a key part of the US Navy war making uh, efforts. But other admirals, even as late as the very last fleet problems, still saw carriers as very much just ancillary support units for the battle line, with the battleships being the star of the show. Of course, with the US, with Pearl Harbor, they were forced rather quickly in the Pacific Theater to effectively recognize carriers as capital ships, because that's essentially all they really had left in any significant number um, that could do significant damage. They were a few standards around, of course, but you know, the damage you could do with the Yorktowns and the Lexingtons compared to the damage you could do with a, you know, four or five standard class. <laughs> yeah, there's a fairly big difference there. And for the British, they didn't have a big Pearl Harbor style event. And indeed, they lost more carriers early, early on in the war than they did capital ships. The capital ship losses tended to catch up sort of mid-war. But... Although they recognised that the carrier was a very important thing, you can see the British still using carriers mostly, not entirely, but mostly as an, an ancillary support arm, pretty much into 1943-44. The, in so you'd say the Royal Navy maybe starts regarding carriers as standalone capital ships in their own right mid-World War Two. The Japanese probably are the earliest to pick up on this, um, with the formation of the Kido Butai and its use as an independent strike arm in um, obviously 1940-41. So, yeah, some point during World War II, between 1940 and 43, depending on which Navy it is that's operating the carriers, at least in my estimation. King Brock asks, it was mentioned in a previous dry dock, although I don't remember which one, that there was a ship that shot a torpedo that was coming towards it out of the water. Given the stories of Japanese pilots crashing their planes in front of torpedoes to save their ships, why wasn't this something that was designed into secondary armaments? A diving 5-inch shell should be able to stop a torpedo, and hitting it would be easier than hitting an aircraft in 3D. A high-mounted 5-inch gun with the capability to shoot downwards at incoming torpedoes to protect the ship seems like a good idea, so why wasn't this done? It's basically the tyranny of math, <laughs> which is to say right-angle triangles. So engineers fun times here. 
basically the problem is the torpedo is normally set to run relatively deep. I mean, exactly how deep you set a torpedo to run, it depends if you think the magnetic detonator is actually working or not, um, and a whole host of other factors. But if we take a median depth of, say, 20 feet, which is reasonable, because the ship that shot the torpedo out of the water, that torpedo was running shallow, so it was possible. You know, you're not going to shoot a torpedo out of the water with a rifle if it's at 20 foot depth. So you also have the other problem of you can see the bubble trail. That doesn't that tells you that there is a torpedo coming. That doesn't actually tell you where the torpedo is. That tells you where the torpedo was. So you'd have to guess where it is ahead of that. Now, if we assume that a torpedo is running at you at 20 foot depth, and let's say you're engaging it at pretty close range, maybe you've only just you only spotted it at the last minute. So you're engaging it at a thousand yards. Now, if the torpedo is 20 feet under the water and you take your typical gun mount, uh, like this 5-inch 38 mount on USS Alabama, now those guns are easily 30 foot plus above the water. So let's say, for sake of argument, that they are 30 feet above the water. Maybe these ones aren't. Maybe the ones actually on the main deck are. But you know, we're talking about a general case for a capital ship or a cruiser maybe. So let's say your theoretical anti-torpedo boat gun is 30 feet above the water. So we have a total distance of 50 feet to cover because you've got to go from 30 foot above the water to 20 foot below the water over a distance of a thousand yards, which is 3000 feet. Now that means the downwards angle that the gun has to depress to is actually just under a degree. So it's entirely possible, in fact, pretty much all secondary guns could depress further than a single degree. So the gun can shoot at a torpedo at a thousand yards. The problem is the distance the shell has to cover underwater. Now he said this gun is theoretically 30 foot above the water, which means that roughly speaking, well, I mean, when you stick all this into a right angle triangle calculator, the 3,000 feet horizontally is such a long distance relative to the 50 feet vertically that the hypotenuse C is 3,000.4 feet. So effectively, the shell is basically traveling 3,000 feet to reach the torpedo, except that two-fifths of that distance is going to be underwater. Now, yes, you can make a diving shell. No, you're not making a diving shell that can travel 1,200 feet underwater. <laughs> to reach the 20 foot down from the one degree depression. Now, you could say, okay, right, fair enough. Diving shell is not going to go 1,200 feet underwater at that range. But what if the torpedo gets a lot closer? Can you engage it then? Well, if you reconfigure the everything for 300 feet, now 300 feet away for a torpedo that's potentially carrying upwards of a thousand pound equivalent of TNT, okay, yeah, that's that's worryingly close, but to be fair, hit, destroying a torpedo 300 feet out is probably a lot, lot better than having it hit you. So plug in the 300 foot figure. Well, now your angle of depression is about nine and a half degrees. Now, OK, at this point, you would probably need to modify quite a number of secondary guns because not all of them can depress that far. Most depression angles are about negative five degrees. But a depression of negative 10 degrees, I mean, it, it could be done. Um, it wouldn't present a colossal challenge. You still, however, face the problem that, you know, two-fifths or 40% of that figure has to now be travelled underwater. So at 300 feet, um, that gives us 304 feet the shell's having to travel because it's, it's now becoming a, a slightly steeper angle. So if we multiply that by 0.4, you've still got a shell that to reach a torpedo 20 foot down has to travel 121 feet through the water. And I suppose you could argue, well, you could just shoot shot slightly higher and hope for the explosive effect to knock the torpedo off course. Well, yes, you could, but then that significantly reduces the lethal radius. You basically have to get a direct hit, relatively speaking, rather than, you know, a sphere of explosive danger for the torpedo. So, it, and, and obviously torpedoes could be set to run deeper than 20 feet, considerably deeper than 20 feet. So you probably want to stick with getting that shell down to 20 feet at the minimum. So what if you go, okay, even closer, 150 feet. Okay, but now we're talking about you're going to get shaken around in the ship, but again, still better than a direct torpedo hit. Well, 150 feet, 
you're now talking about the shell traveling 158 feet, which means that your shell now has to travel 63 feet through the water and the gun has to be able to depress down to about 18 and a half degrees. You're now talking a fairly steep dangle of depression for the gun. That's going to be quite difficult to sort out. You know, base near enough as makes no difference. Almost nearly negative 20 degrees depression. Um, you may, for some secondary guns, depending on their placement and height above the upper deck you, or main deck, you may have issues with the blast or the shell itself having to, you know, interact possibly quite violently with the side of the ship, which may not be desirable. And you're still talking about a shell that has to travel 60 plus feet underwater. Now, okay, 60 plus feet, 60 feet underwater, 63 feet to be exact, or 63.2, from a five inch gun, if you've got a specifically designed diving shell, that might be possible. But you'd have to, you know, as I said, you'd have to come up with a gun that can depress an awful lot. And even if it works, you're talking about a torpedo that might actually detonate, you know, within 100, 150 feet of your hull, which is, you know, to suffice to say, not an ideal circumstance. Uh, the problem is that, in theory, you can make this problem much easier by making the gun higher. So a gun, say, in a fighting top, reminiscent of pre-World War I style, because if you increase the vertical height, then you are actually making the depression. Well, well this is it. You, it's six one half times in the other. You're making a gun that has to depress considerably further, and you're make, using a gun that's going to have to be considerably smaller because it's going to be considerably higher up. And a smaller gun with less power can penetrate through less water, but equally it is having to penetrate through less water because the angle is going to be a bit steeper. But its explosive radius is going to be smaller, so the chances of the of a hit or a near miss actually stopping the torpedo is considerably less. So yeah, th this short, possibly slightly long exercise in mathematics is why you don't tend to see anti-torpedo guns deployed on various ships. And with everything we've just discussed, that all works assuming a torpedo is coming at 20 feet. If the enemy sets your tor their torpedo to run at 30 feet, yeah, everything is now ruined and you have to start over again with an even more extreme gun. The thing with, as I mentioned at the beginning, with the torpedo that was shot out of the water, that's a shallow running torpedo. Sure, you can shoot at that. Um, but with the Japanese kamikaze pilots going in at, at torpedoes, one, potentially some of those torpedoes were running shallow, and two, even if they weren't, a aircraft that goes in vertically will reach a depth that, where it can interact with the torpedo quite readily. And also, obviously, if they're much higher overhead, they can probably see the torpedo running. Whereas if you're looking very much more horizontal, it's going to be very difficult to see the torpedo running. The Freaker 86 asks, the British made enormous efforts to protect Ultra at Bletchley Park so that, to my knowledge, the Germans did not seriously consider the fact that the Enigma code might have been breached. But how close did the Germans come to the conclusion there might be something wrong with Enigma and that they needed to take action? At a high level, the Germans were never really convinced or massively suspicious that Enigma had been breached because, well, all the indicators that they seemed to have in terms of the complexity of Enigma versus the capabilities of computing at the time, especially if you're trying to just brute force your way through things, seemed to indicate that it was impossible. There are records of both the Italians, who used a variant of Enigma um, for some of their communications, and some of the lower-level German intel and other military officers having rather deep suspicions that Enigma had been breached and trying to persuade their superiors of this. But they, unfortunately for the Axis war effort, were unable to make much headway because, as I said, the higher-ups just kept coming back to the statistically this is impossible, which combined with allied efforts to turn around and say, ah, yes, well, you know, there's all these other plausible ways by which things could have been discovered. It gave people who were already predisposed to thinking Enigma was unbreakable an excuse to think that it still was. Um, so, for example, uh, as was mentioned earlier, the Battle of the Beta or Duisburg Convoy, 
the Allies knew where that convoy was going, thanks to signal intelligence, but to give a plausible cover as to why they were able to ambush the convoy at night, they actually sent out a recon aircraft. They told the aircraft where to go, but then it meant that from an outside perspective and from an Axis perspective, they would be looking around going, well, how could they possibly have known where our convoy was? And then they look at the reports. Oh, yeah, in late afternoon, just before the attack, this random RAF reconnaissance aircraft showed up and spotted us. Well, that was unlucky. I guess that's how they knew where we were. Um, <laughs> and various efforts like these. John McCarthy asks, what made the Mark 38 fire control system so effective? Now, that's a good question. The Mark 38 fire control system is sometimes a little less spoken about because a lot of people, and rightly so, speak about the Mark 37, which is the primarily anti-aircraft but can also do anti-surface um, fire control system, which is found in in four installations on US fast battleships, but the Mark 38 is the dedicated surface fire control fire control system for the main battery guns, the 16-inch guns. And here is one of the two systems installed on USS Iowa because the Iowa class had a front and an aft Mark 38 installation. Now there is a small element of what's visible here that made it so good. Um, although it's not particularly visible in this shot because we're looking up from a fairly close distance. The big bar across, that's obviously an optical rangefinder, but then on top, if you look at any of the preserved Iowas, you'll see there's also a bunch of radar. Now, that helps especially because, to be perfectly fair, US optical rangefinders were okay. Um, they weren't absolute world-beating top-end-of-the-line systems, that honour, frankly, goes to the Japanese, closely followed by the Italians, although a lot of the Italian optical fire control uh, capability came from the fact they also had so many of the flipping things. Um, but, you know, US optical uh, rangefinders, they're decent. You know, I'm not saying they're, they're bad, but they're not the world leaders. Um, but when it comes to this tower section, the radar... You know, the US, along with the UK, is pretty much the leading uh, the leading two powers on radar, especially once the UK shared its cavity magnetron tech. And the US has the advantage of not only can it develop really nice radars, but it can also mass produce them in reliable quantities, well, both in mass quantities and they are reliable. And that gives US ships, especially obviously something like an Iowa, an additional leg up because, of course, any optical range finding system is subject to human error and is only adjusted as often as a human can adjust it. Radar, as far as World War II fire control is concerned, returns basically near continuous data, usually to a much higher fidelity. So, you know, the whole thing with data garbage in, garbage out, well, if the data is better, then better data in means a better solution out. But this is only half of the equation. The other half is much deeper in the ship, down in the plotting room. And that's where you'll find something like this, a component of the Mark I fire control system or fire control computer, which is an overall, which is then part of the wider plotting room fire control systems. And this is where the ranging data and bearing data, etc., that's taken up on that tower we saw earlier is taken and converted into data for the guns. So as you can see here, you've got the target and your own ship. So obviously stuff like the RPM of your own ship and therefore speed, that can all be fed in. And then the data from up top can be fed in. And that will hopefully give you the relative bearings and speeds of the two, tar two target vessels, as in the ves vessels for which the calculations are being done, i.e. you and the enemy. That will then give a relative speed and bearing and then plug in atmospheric conditions, wind as much as you can assess it. And this system will then obviously generate your fire firing solution. And it's this fire control system down here, the electromechanical computer set system, that really is the heart of it. And that's what makes both the Mark 37 and the Mark 38 so effective in that they can calculate to an extremely high degree of precision, especially if you give them good data, where you should aim your guns in order to hit your targets. And they can keep that lock as 
your ship changes its course and speed. World War I fire control systems and some that were still in use in World War II could not do this. But the more advanced ones, like the US one, could. And again, the US had the advantage of being able to near enough mass manufacture these systems. Of course, you've then got the ballistics of the gun, the flight time of the shell, the weather conditions that you can't observe, and a host of other factors which might play into things. But relatively simply put, as long as you could give this system good data and utilize it properly, you could have a very, very accurately firing ship. Where you do occasionally have issues with the the Mark 38 system, or rather the guns that have been fired using the Mark 38 system, and not achieving all that much in terms of hits, which, to be fair, one or two of the engagements the Iowa's were involved in in World War II, that was a problem. That wasn't a fault with these systems. In fact, even in the 1980s when the Iowa's were being refitted, the US Navy found that these systems were pretty much as good or better than any electronic systems they could devise at the time. The problem was the quality of the data that was being put in in the first place, because you know if you put in your speed, but you failed to account for a current and you're actually drifting sideways by half a knot or so, then your solution will be wrong. So you've got to know all of this stuff first before you can ask a system to give you the right answer. Yakuzka Girls Mar Marine High School Training Vessel Harakaze asks, I was reading an account of the scuttling of the Graf Spey, and it mentions most of the crew being offloaded before she slipped her mooring, and then sailing out before stopping and offloading the majority of the remainder, before sailing a little way again before stopping and the last 11 crew came off. Why did she sail a second distance after offloading the majority of the skeleton crew, and what positions or jobs did the last 11 have apart from the captain? So when she left her port for the final time, Graf Spey had about 60 men aboard. This was essentially the minimum number needed to actually get the ship moving, and moving in a vaguely safely, safe and controlled manner. Once she was out in the channel, it was then time to offload most of them, which is why she stopped the first time. So the majority of the skeleton crew were taken off at that stage by various craft. But then uh, Langsdorf didn't want to scuttle Graf Spey in the middle of a shipping channel, which is where she was at the time, which is why other ships could come alongside her. And so what was left aboard, the last 12 men, including the captain, that that was essentially the scuttling party. So the ship was then moved because obviously it had got now gotten underway. So most of the men weren't required and it could move a short distance, basically just with the handful aboard. And so it was moved off into an area where it wouldn't end up inconveniencing other shipping because you don't want to tick off the neutral powers even more. And while she was underway, to there, then that's the, the last people aboard the scuttling party were positioning the charges, setting the fuses, etc. Then she ran aground on some soft mud, which is why when she scuttled herself, she ends up basically like this, as you can see in the picture. And then with the scuttling charges set, then the last party can be taken off. And because it's only a small party, they can then be taken off by boat. Runon asks, in Drydock episode 208, part 1, you show a picture of a ship's stern. What are the lifting eyes or shackles for, and are they permanently mounted? My best guess is they're there for work on props and the prop shafts, but the photo places them at an awkward angle. You would be correct. These shackles or lifting eyes are indeed to help with mounting and demounting the ship's screws and off screen or off the shot, there will also be similar units around the rudder for helping mount and dismount the rudder. However, whilst the shackles themselves are permanently mounted, and if you look at high detail shots of various ships in dock, you'll actually see that pretty much all battleships and other other uh, vessels have them. Uh, for example, there's a really nice stern shot of one of the Iowas, which shows a whole load of these shackles in place. The lifting eyes, the dangling bits, they are not permanent. Those would be installed um, or just you know bolted in when the ship is in dock and it needs work being done for fairly obvious reasons. You don't want those rattling around and bashing things and accumulating detritus while the ship's underway. Um, so 
yeah, they've been put in to help work on the ship, but once the ship is ready to go in the either back in the water or in the water, uh, depending on whether it's in dry dock or whether it's being built, then the lifting eyes themselves will be removed and just the shackle will be left in place. Christopher Villenfort asks, Catapult placements. I've seen many different placements of catapults, both fixed and movable on cruisers and battleships. Could you go through the advantages and disadvantages for the various ones, including maybe some of the more odd ones? There are three main types of catapult placement on capital ships for the World War I, World War II period, and then a fourth, slightly rarer one, which the Italians were a big fan of, which is to have the catapult launcher on the bow. But most commonly, the catapult launchers are either on the stern, as you can see here with HMS Hood, or pretty much any US fast battleship, on the turret, which is rarer by World War II, but very common in World War I, and amidships, which is used by the Kriegsmarine and the Royal Navy, for example. And then other navies tend to use one, the other, or a mix of thereof. So, there, as you indicate, there are advantages and disadvantages to each. The advantages of the bow launch system is that obviously the ship can just head straight into the wind and off goes the aircraft. It's an ideal launch position, although, of course, the uh, aircraft has, has to be, the, well, the entire ship has to be positioned to launch the aircraft, ideally, because bow mounted catapults tend not to be very trainable, which would mean that. Obviously, if you launch the aircraft crossways into the wind, there's a chance it may either tip, stall, or flip, or you know, various other things rather nasty could happen to it. But it gives you a fairly clear launch way. Uh, you know, there's nothing in the way, um, and you can get a fairly long run up because the ship's bow tends to be fairly long, which means that you have a slightly gentler acceleration curve. So you know, there are some advantages. The disadvantages, obviously, is that that area is going to get hit quite a lot in as the seas get rougher, which may make it impossible to launch the aircraft. And you've usually got to come up with some kind of system to get the aircraft there in the first place because bow-mounted hangars on gun-based uh, warships don't really tend to be a thing. So that's the, the least used one. The turret mount catapult is quite useful because obviously the turret can be trained in lots of different directions so you can train the turret into the wind to launch the aircraft even if the ship's going in a slightly different direction or a very different direction for that matter um, which is quite useful it's also going to be usually the especially if you're on the super firing turret the highest mount position of the four main catapult mount positions we're talking about which means you've got the most drop if you know something goes wrong engine stall out etc etc it doesn't take up any existing deck space that you might use for anything else because apart from in the latter part of World War II when people are sticking AA guns on turrets, people don't tend to use their turret roofs for much else. So, And of course, because it's high, it's also usually dry, which means you can store an aircraft up there, relatively speaking, without risk of it being damaged by the elements. The disadvantages are that there's a limit to the size of aircraft you can put on there because the launch ramp is going to be relatively short. Um, there is a potential hazard if the turret takes a hit in battle. You've got all this extra apparatus on top which might be set on fire or just mangled and uh, block the view of the turret or block up some mechanism of the turret. And it's also very difficult, relatively speaking, to access and maintain the aircraft if you're going to store it on top of the turret and it is obviously exposed, you could in theory have a hangar elsewhere and crane it onto the turret for a launch, but that's an extra bit of difficulty and complication. Then you have the aft mounted catapults, as seen here, and as I said, found on a lot of US fast capital ships. Now, those allow you probably the second most trainable launchers, possibly the most trainable, depending on the type of launcher compared to turret launchers and you can crane the aircraft out of the water straight back onto the launch rail if you want um, which is obviously relatively useful and the aircraft do not present a fire hazard to the rest of the ship um, I mean obviously they could be set on fire and that might be bad on the fantail but it's relatively easy to ditch those aircraft 
if that does happen, as indeed did happen a few times during the Pacific campaign. Uh, the disadvantages of it are that obviously being at an extreme end of the ship, it's potentially going to be moving up and down a fair bit, which may limit when you can launch the aircraft. Uh, quarter decks can, or fantails, depending on what you want to call them, um, can get somewhat wet, uh, especially on hood, which can make operations a bit more difficult and also make maintenance and keeping the aircraft intact a little bit more difficult. And if you're going to have a hangar for the aircraft, then it usually has to be somewhere else. So you have to invent a relatively long and complex and therefore heavy transportation system to move the aircraft from the hangar to the launcher and from the launcher to the hangar, etc. and so on. Uh, if you've got a really big ship like the Japanese, you could try for an, in or the Italians for that matter, with the Latorios, um, you could try an internal hangar in the aft of the ship, which both Yamato and Latorio had, which is an option, um, albeit, again, a relatively complex procedure and using up internal hull volume, which might be usable for something else. And then lastly, you have the amidships launcher. Now that's seen on various British fast battleships of the and refitted battleships of the Second World War. It's also found on US cruisers from the interwar period. Now, this offers the most sustainable, I guess would be the term, launch position because it's amidships. It's relatively high, so you're relatively likely to be dry. The Of all the parts of the ship that may be bouncing up and down in the weather, it's the part that's going to be moving the least. Um, you've got a, relative, a relatively long cross-deck catapult going on usually, which gives you a decent amount of acceleration up, which means you can launch somewhat larger aircraft like a walrus. You can have the hangar right next to it um, if you are going to have a hangar, which minimizes the travel distance, which is quite useful. And it's relatively sheltered both in and out of the hangar for maintenance. You can obviously have the cranes mounted right nearby to maneuver them back straight on board into the vicinity of the launch and hangar areas, which is somewhat similar to what you can do with the stern launcher system. But the disadvantage is that it does take up probably the single greatest amount of otherwise usable deck space. You know, you might, if you look at uh, a US fast battleship, you have uh, for the 35,000 tonners and for the others for that matter, but more relevantly for the 35,000 tonners, you have five twin mounts either side for the anti-aircraft systems because you've got that full amidships deck uh, run available. Whereas if you look at something like the King George V's, then they only have four twin 5.25s and there's a big space in the middle where you could have fitted another 5.25 or maybe even two twin 5.25 turrets but that's all taken up with the aircraft launching facility and handling facilities and so there's a big gap in between the front two and the rear two 5.25s so it takes up the most real estate and it also poses the greatest hazard to the ship because as a number of US cruisers found out uh, during the night actions of Guadalcanal these hangars and the aircraft tend to be full of a lot of very very flammable things and made of very flammable things and if the ship takes a hit amidships and that catches fire that can be very very bad for the ship assuming of course that these things do catch fire um you, there are ways to mitigate that by stashing fuel below decks when the ship goes to action stations um, the aircraft itself can obviously be launched usually would be launched to help out but it is still a risk and a use of uh, deck space that could be used for anti-aircraft armament and other facilities. So yeah, brief advantage disadvantage listing of the four main placements for aircraft launchers. Reichsbeer Minister asks, what are your top three wins and top three sins in terms of impact on the war for ship hulls that were converted to aircraft carriers from World War One to Korea? A win being it was very much worth it to convert this hull from its original form to a carrier. A sin being the hull would have performed much better in its planned or original form as a battleship, cruiser, battle cruiser, and so forth. So top three in terms of winning, that's easy. The Courageous class, the Lexington class, and I'm going to go actually for the Independence class as well. Now the reasoning for those is that well, OK, fair enough. Britain didn't get a huge amount of wartime use out of Courageous and Glorious before they were both sunk very early. But they did get very handy use out of Furious for the duration of second the Second World War. 
And this kind of combines with the fact that in terms of Reich Beer Minister's qualifications, was it worth the effort to convert the whole from its original form to a CB? Very much so, because to be perfectly frank, Courageous, Glorious and Furious were not exactly the world's most useful ships in their original format. So while they may not have made absolute ideal carrier conversions and based on you know the Japanese getting a Margin cargo and the Americans getting Lexington and Saratoga, it might have been better if the Royal Navy had held on to two of the incomplete Admiral class hulls and done them as carriers instead. Still, given what they had to work with, it was very definitely worth it. The Royal Navy got much more in terms of experience and usage out of them in the interwar period as well as some use, obviously, in the wartime period than they would ever have gotten had they kept them in their original gun-based forms. The Lexingtons pretty much allowed the US to develop its carrier doctrine through the bulk of the interwar period, as you've seen with the Fleet Problems videos. The Yorktowns, although they were laid down in the mid-1930s, don't actually really enter service, and that's Yorktown and Enterprise, until really late. So it's the Lexingtons in particular that are allowing the US Navy to develop most of its lessons about aircraft carrier usage during the interwar period. And otherwise, the hulls would have had to be scrapped. And they actually made for pretty decent carriers generally as well. I mean, OK, Lexington went up like a fireball due to some damage control issues the US hadn't realised yet quite yet. But once they did realise it, you look at the absolute beating that Saratoga took over time. And she remained afloat and remained a, a good carrier right up pretty much until the end. Now, the reason I didn't mention the Japanese, like Akagi and Kaga, is because, well, to a certain extent, I'd be repeating what I said for the Lexingtons. But then both Akagi and Kaga were sunk pretty early on. OK, so a couple of months after Lexington was, but yeah, near as much as it makes no difference. Whereas with the independences, whilst they're not, you know, absolutely all singing, all dancing, brilliant fleet carriers, they do give a surprisingly decent air wing for their size, and they're able to be done fairly quickly. Let's face it, with the number of Clevelands the US was building, it wasn't exactly short on cruisers, but what they were short on uh, by the end of 1942 and beginning of 1943 were aircraft carriers, and the independences not only give them a reasonable amount of aircraft capacity pretty quickly, but they also give a redundancy in aircraft capacity that shows quite often during the rest of the war. So you can do things using an independence that you might not necessarily be able to justify doing with a full fleet carrier. And you are able to do run experiments that, again, you can justify freeing up a fleet, uh, an independence class for, but you couldn't necessarily justify freeing up a fleet carrier to do and you couldn't really do an escort carrier either because it's too small or too slow and when it comes to the redundancy of damage because there's so many independences present so quickly it means that if you have two or three of them operating with a task force you have still substantially increased your air power but if you either lose an independence as you know, with Princeton it's not a colossal kick in the teeth for the entire task force but at the same time if one of your fleet carriers has to go home for damage which did happen relatively regularly you don't have to worry about having to cycle in or cycle out a big expensive fleet carrier to plug a massive gap in your air defenses if say your task force has two or three Essex available or York towns for that matter um well enterprise i guess but after 42 um, but if you've got the independences there, it lessens that impact. So, you know, if you have three fleet carriers and three uh, independences, and let's say one of your fleet carriers gets hit by kamikaze, has to go back to get fixed, another one is damaged and is, has limited capacity, operating on one and a half fleet carriers would be quite dangerous. Operating on one and a half fleet carriers plus three independences, for example, actually your air groups are still perfectly viable for for defence and strike. Now, in terms of the sins, i.e. the hull would have performed much better in its original or planned form, believe it, I'm not actually going to put Bairn here. There are a number of reasons 
in fact quite a few, why Bairn is not a particularly brilliant carrier. But in terms of the qualifications for this question, would Bairn have performed better in her original form as a Normandy-class battleship? Well, I mean, technically, yes. But at the end of the day, you know, given when she was would have been completed, i.e. the mid-1920s, by the time World War Two rolls around, it's very likely that Bern would have been, as a battleship, in the same condition as the some surviving Corbets and the Britannias. You know, slow, not the best maintained, not particularly capable by World War Two standards. Certainly, nothing compared to the Dunkirks or the Richelieu's, and probably would have just then ended up either being shelled at Merz el Kabir or stuck in a harbour somewhere and to either be scuttled or, or wait out the bulk of the war, which, you know, that isn't really going to perform all that much better than Bairn. I mean, at least Bairn survived and was of some use towards the end of the war, even if it wasn't as a frontline fleet carrier. Uh, uh, so in this particular case, actually, the, the easy low-hanging fruit is just to go after the Japanese Navy because... There are, well, there's there's a lot of carriers you could point to that were converted as pretty bad um, and would have done better in their original forms, but I'm going to pick three easy ones. So this is Chioda, Chioda uh, part of the Chitose class. They were seaplane tenders. Now, I'm not necessarily saying all the seaplane tender conversions were, were bad, and in and of itself, as a conversion of a seaplane tender, Chioda and Chitose are not necessarily that incapable the main reason I think that, that this was a pretty dumb idea is that unlike some of the earlier seaplane tender conversions, by the time these ones were complete and in the water, the war was nearly over and the Japanese didn't have the aircraft or the pilots to stick on them. So it was a conversion that ended up you know, not really being able to be used all that much except for at the Battle of the Philippine Sea as an actual carrier at which stage those resources probably would have been better put into just anything else like other anti-submarine escorts for which in their original form of seaplane tenders they might actually have also served a somewhat useful role and then the other two easy ones to point out to are the Issei and Hugo conversion to hybrids and Megami's conversion to a hybrid because I've gone on a long length why a the hybrid carrier concept at least as envisaged by those three ships isn't a particularly brilliant one and especially the fact that if you are in the middle of doing emergency conversions to hybrid carriers in the middle of a war whilst there is some theoretical utility to that if you can pull it off correctly the fact that you are having to do that indicates that you have far larger issues and given what they actually ended up doing you know look at Megami's record after she was converted she could have just used the extra guns the aircraft didn't really help and the same with Issei and Huga they basically end up being glorified cargo ships and or bait for which they could have done that just as easily with their original guns and again the resources could have been better used elsewhere cringe pog asks Given your comparison in the Battleship Guns video for the Tennessee-class guns versus the Colorado-class guns, how would this affect which ships would be more effective in anti-shipping and shore bombardment duties? And would this make the West Virginia or Tennessee-California a better ship overall after the modernizations are finished? Well, it depends who you're facing and at what range. Um, to be perfectly honest, at the realistic battle ranges, i.e. The, the ranges at which capital ships would have fought each other in the late 1910s, uh, kind of with Jutland as a baseline. The Tennessees probably would have been a little bit better at the anti-shipping activities than the Colorados, simply because at those kind of ranges, pretty much everybody would have been about as vulnerable to the 14-inch guns of Tennessee as they would have been to the 16-inch guns of Colorado. And of course, there's four more guns on a Tennessee, so four more chances to hit. However, once you, you know, go a little bit forward in time to look at the ships that the Colorados 
obviously they when they're designing them they don't know that they're going to be facing them but they can anticipate that they're going to be facing um nagato for example okay she's not the best armored but she does have 16 inch guns um nelson and then the successes that people were planning on you know n3 south dakota tosa etc at that stage had battleship development continued there would be a real risk that the Tennessee's 14-inch guns would be facing enemies who had very large immune zones against them, whereas the Colorado's 16-inch guns would have a smaller immune zone to deal with, which would mean that the Colorado's, as future-proof designs, are better vessels for, um, for anti-shipping duties. Plus, of course, Although you have fewer chances to hit, if you do hit with a 16-inch shell, it's likely to do a bit more damage per hit than a 14-inch shell. So there's that as well, I guess. But when it comes to shore bombardment duties, especially once the modernizations are done, with the grace of respect to West Virginia, the Tennessee's and Cali Tennessee and California would have been more useful ships because if you're fighting a Japanese bunker... 14 inch or 16 inch shell really doesn't make an awful lot of difference you're really just about as dead but again you come back to well we can fire four more rounds per full salvo or two more rounds per half salvo with the tennessees so just weight of fire for shore bombardment duties so yeah whilst the colorados are manifestly a better battleship at the time they are constructed than the tennessees especially when you look to you know the potential and actual futures in the 1920s and 30s because they can hit harder and at longer ranges for purely short bombardment duties the it's just number of heavy guns is is more of an issue and the other thing you also have to bear in mind when you're talking about fighting in battle lines and why the Colorados are designed the way they are the US Navy is thinking about fighting at quite long ranges and at the long ranges they think they're going to be fighting at, albeit for the time it turned out that was probably a little unrealistic, the 16-inch shell retains its armor-piercing capabilities far, far better at long range than the 14-inch does. Andronor asks, Would it have been more useful for the Kriegsmarine to not send out their surface ships as raiders and use them as a fleet in being, like Tirpitz eventually end up being in Norway? I'd assume maybe basing them out of the western or southern coast of France to tie down forces in the Atlantic or the Mediterranean. It might have been for a while, and it certainly would have caused a lot of concern, especially as their numbers built up. For, you know, if, if for example, you had both of the Scharnhorst and both of the Bismarcks, plus, I mean, okay, Graf Spee's gone very early, so, but let's say you still have Scheer and Lutzow, Hipper and Prince Eugen, so ironically enough, sets of pairs, um, ready to go. So effectively, four heavy cruisers, four battleships, sitting either in the same port or very near each other, that would be a very substantial force, which the Royal Navy would have to commit equally heavy forces to be able to counter. I mean, you'd be looking at a, having to maintain a battle group of at least six to eight cruisers, uh, a good number of them heavy cruisers. So, you know, probably four counties and a couple of towns or four counties and four towns or some variant thereof. Plus, if you've got, you know, four fast battleships sitting there by you know, by the time Tirpitz commissions, you're, in order to assure yourself of a level of superiority to guarantee that you'll, you'll be able to head these guys off without catastrophic defeat, you're talking about, you know, needing at least four, well, at least four fast capital ships, possibly five or six, and whether you have the fifth or sixth is a do you have the availability for it and b um, what other forces are you deploying because for example you might as because in this case we're assuming Bismarck doesn't sail you might then go with say having Hood and King George V Prince of Wales which wouldn't be sent to Japan in this scenario and the recently commissioned Duke of York by 1942 you might have maybe North Carolina or Washington on on call as well because they spent some time over this side of things. And you'd want to back it up with at least two carriers. So to use the carriers to get an advantage by crippling, disabling, or destroying some of the ships before you go in to engage in a battle line engagement. So you'd be talking about, you know, five or six battleships, two carriers, and you've got to have more than that because you can't keep them on station at all time or on ready call at all times. So you've 
you'd probably be at that point arguing for keeping all the King George V's plus Hood, plus appealing to the Americans for Washington and North Carolina to hang around, plus probably Ranger, plus you know, Victorious, and any other British carrier, so three carriers. To keep your six to eight cruisers up to strength, you're going to need a dozen cruisers at least you know, in wartime, and that's a big draw, plus destroy flotillas to escort them. So yeah, you could tie down a lot of Royal Navy capacity. You probably have Nelson and Rodney in there for good measure, or at least one of them. Um, but whilst this all sounds good in principle, tying down a huge amount of uh, British and American combat strength, which is also indirectly going to help out the Italians in the Mediterranean, if you have your fleet in being concentrated in such a manner that actually forces the, the Allies to concentrate forces in return... It also makes you basically priority target number one. So if you think what happened to Brest when the two Shan horse were there was bad, y there's going to be an awful lot more of that and still other things. And as we saw with Gneisen out repeatedly and Shan horse a couple of times, just being in a heavily defended port does not stop you from being hit and potentially almost sunk in by the Beaufort when Gneisen was in France and then actually damage beyond repair when she was in Germany. So you could end up with just an attritional loss of your fleet without it ever doing anything. Plus, again, you know, when you see things like the X-Craft and 617 Squadron, etc., with Tirpitz in Norway, if you've got this big fleet all concentrated in one place, the the law dash the reward for the Royal Navy to turn around and invent some really sneaky way of getting in and doing some really major damage is going to be much, much higher, which is going to drive them to try a lot, lot more, which you're going to have this escalating routine of paranoia on the Germans' part, trying to cover every aspect uh, of attack, and the Royal Navy trying to come up with new ways to attack that they haven't thought of yet, um, which, you know, could end up going very, very badly for one side or the other. But you know, the worst case scenario, you could end up with your entire fleet sunk at its moorings without ever firing a shot, which would really be a bad day to be a critics when you're an officer. So yeah, it, it could have been more useful if the dice rolls fall in the Greeks in his favour, but there'd be a lot of people trying to leverage the dice so they don't. Leon Wu asks, I just learned about the Mount Hood detonation and that there's no known cause. Is that still accurate? And what are your thoughts on what happened? Well, I wouldn't say there's no known cause. Mount Hood was an ammunition ship. It's fairly clear that the ammunition is what exploded. Um, I know that sounds a little bit trite, but um, more specifically, we do actually know a certain amount. Not a huge amount, because explosions of this scale tend not to leave a lot of evidence behind, other than a massive crater. But we do know that just before the, ex the main explosion a relatively large flame along with smoke came up from amidships and reached about masthead height before then the rest of the cargo exploded. She was an ammunition ship and well, there's the result on screen. Now, from the report that was done by the Navy afterwards, it points out a number of things, including that pyrotechnics and napalm were stowed in an open temporary wooden tar paper hut on deck under hazardous conditions near the hatch to hut number four hold. The explosion happening somewhere between number three and number four hold. So although we don't know for certain, and you know, some people, I'm not entirely sure why, but some people still ask things like, you know, similar to the Mount Hood explosion, oh, why don't we just go down to hood? Uh, actually, ironically enough, HMS Hood, and work out what it, how what happened to her from the wreck. And it's like, um, when a magazine explodes, it tends to destroy everything in the local vicinity, so any evidence of exactly what did happen has been scattered into postage stamp-sized pieces across the local landscape. Same thing here. There is no smoking gun, because the biggest piece of the Mount Hood it, it, that was found is about you know, a couple of dozen square feet across, and uh, that was just one fragment. Everything else is just, as, again, in bits. Now, 
it might seem that, yes, if you store a bunch of pyrotechnics and napalm in a wood and tar paper hut on an open deck where they knew, um, for again from the report, that the crew were not really exerting proper care and attention when it came to handling ammunition, that might seem the most likely location for a explosion to start. However, um, my personal theory, and you know, this is tentative, so I'm not massively beholden to it, but I think it, it may be just a fraction more likely, is in another part of the report, it mentions that in numbers two and three holds, so particularly three, because three is adjacent to where the, the initial explosion was seen to take place, there were broken rocket bodies from which some of the powder the propellant had spilled. Now, if a bunch of pyrotechnics and napalm had gone up, you would expect there to be a lot of flame, yes, um, but maybe not quite as much smoke as the reports seem to indicate of that initial flare-up. It would be a lot, a lot more fire than smoke, a bit like, ironically enough, given the names, again, the initial flame that was seen just before HMS Hood exploded. But if you had a bunch of loose propellant powder from rockets down in a hold that's been opened up, because we know, again, from the report that various holds were opened up and they were loading things in and out, particularly we know that the hatches were open and uh, number three hold was in use, Given that smoking was somehow being allowed to go on during this loading operation, my personal suspicion is that maybe somebody just flicked a used cigarette, but still lit, down a hatch into number three hold, thinking that, oh, you know, there's a bunch of bombs, because 500-pound bombs were what was being hauled in and out at that, po at that stage. You know, a 500-pound bomb is not going to be in any way, shape, or form affected by a lit cigarette, even if it was still lit by the time it reached the bottom of the hold. Perhaps that was done by someone who was offloading ammunition and didn't know that there were broken rocket bodies in there. The cigarette comes into contact with some spilled powder. The powder goes up, that sets off the rest of the rocket bodies. And then you get this woof of flame, which would also explain the smoke because it'd be confined burn, um, not so much oxygen and a fairly loose burn to start with. And it's right in the heart of the ship, which would explain why almost immediately everything else just went pop. The almighty Hypnotoad asks, I was looking through public shipbuilding records in Newfoundland and found the small HW Stone shipyard in the tiny outport of Monroe built four vessels for the Royal Navy during the Second World War, MMS 119, 120, 121 and 122. Was it common for small colonial shipyards the size of HW Stone to build vessels for the Royal Navy? And if so, were the vessels built similar in dimension and role as the ones built by H.W. Stone? Finally, what was the service record of the H.W. Stone built vessels? The only information I found was that they were converted to something else in 1942. With regards to service careers, there's not a tremendous amount that's easy to find. I suspect I'd have to go rifling through Admiralty service records at some point. But what I can find is that the... Uh, the three, well, the four vessels that were built, MMS 119 through 122, were actually renamed. Uh, so they actually got proper ship names, 119, for example, becoming the Emberley. And they appear to have served in Grimsby as part of the minesweeping flotilla there. At least that's where they were in 1942. Um, where they went thereafter is a little bit harder to determine, as I said, and they were then sold out in 1948. But in larger terms of... You know, small colonial shipyards building vessels for the Royal Navy. In World War II, this was actually very common. Um, there's a reason there's a flower class in the picture at the moment. And that's because a lot of ships, small ships that the Royal Navy used, including specifically the flower class, were designed along the line, either using the lines or along the lines of, or to the standards of, existing merchant ship types, precisely because they could therefore then be built in non-military shipyards or shipyard or private shipyards that had not done military work before. And this obviously massively expanded the number of yards that could supply small craft, which had a double advantage in that A, 
you know, more production capacity overall, and B, it meant that the bigger yards and the yards with existing military production could concentrate on bigger, more military orientated vessels, whether that be destroyers, cruisers, capital ships, maybe even some of the bigger frigates and so forth. Whereas flower class corvettes and minesweepers, which the MMS 1192122 series were, and so on and so forth, they could all be built to, com relatively speaking, commercial standards in commercial yards with relatively little pre-existing military building experience. Fletcher, Fletcher's, Fetching, Fletcher, Fletcher, Fletching, Fetcher, Fetching, Fletcher's, Fletcher, Fletcher, Fletchings asks, how did the invention of Morse code affect ship communications? And when did ships started using, start using signal lamps to relay complex communications in real time? Morse code's effect on ship communications actually pretty much coincides with signal lamp development. So the signal lamps were first initially used on a wide scale in navies by the British in the 18, late 1860s. And then going forward into the 1870s and 1880s, everybody else started to copy and adopt the system. Initially, the British signal lamp system actually used a, they used a similar dot dash system, but a different code base to Morse code. But it became very rapidly apparent that Morse code, thanks to being invented and then refined a little bit earlier, had already spread quite widely. And then suddenly it was like, well, okay, well, we can just use that. And then everybody can understand us, which in peacetime at least was a fairly good idea um, and was e easier to then learn because people might learn Morse code separately to the Navy having to teach them. So at that stage, they could use signal lamps to relay Morse code messages in real time, which was great. And the Morse code allowed, or some form of dot dash code allowed for the use of signal lamps in this manner, because everything else that had been used prior, um, mostly signal flags, occasionally s attempts with semaphore and so forth, they relied on quite a d degree of visual clarity, which couldn't necessarily be guaranteed, especially in the dark or in fog. Whereas a signal lamp, whilst it couldn't reach particularly far in fog. If it was a dense fog, a signal lamp flashing Morse code could still be read at considerably greater distances than you could see flag signals, let alone understand them. And at night, obviously, again, flag signals rather difficult to uh, see unless they're illuminated. And we're talking about the 1860s, 1870s. Electrical illumination aboard ships is still very, very much in its infancy. So sticking spotlights and so forth to illuminate your flag signal is not really so much of a thing. Whereas a nice discreet flashing light can be quite useful to work out what's being said. Um, but of course, Morse code had a secondary effect on ship communication because as the century came to an end and you got to the beginning of the 20th century, then radio telegraphy started to be introduced. So not only could you transmit signals by Morse code via signal lamp, but you could also transmit Morse code signals via the radio. So now ships could communicate at very long distances with other ships and shore stations, and again, non-weather dependent for the most part. And that remains pretty much the case until you eventually start to get uh, slightly shorter, more data-rich versions of radio communication like voice radio, but that still takes another 15, 20 years to even start to be introduced into navies. Mike Lima 777 asks, It seems that of the ships converted into carriers due to the Washington Naval Treaty, those based off of full-size battle cruisers seem to be the most useful with good speed and capacity. Yeah, pretty much true. Hypothetically, if the UK, Germany, Italy and France were able to convert a battle cruiser design that they had up until 1920 into an aircraft carrier, which would be the most ideal? Well, the Italians, as far as I'm aware, don't have any full battle cruiser designs in the Dreadnought period up to 1920, so they you know, don't have a potential conversion hull. Uh, I think their first battle cruiser designs came about in the mid 1920s, even if you want to call some of their pre Dreadnought type vessels potentially precursors to battle cruisers. Anyway. When you look at the um, remaining contenders, then France, Germany and the UK, well, due to obviously carriers are better, the more volume they have, which allows them to fit more aircraft. So you want to go for the biggest design 
of battle cruiser that was realistically going to be constructed and also you want to go for the fastest if you at all can so with france that's fairly easy they only have a couple of real battle cruiser designs i mean they have one that's a bit earlier um which is in 1911 but then they have some 1913 designs as well broadly speaking you're looking at roughly the same characteristics there's somewhere between 670 to 690 feet long capable of 28 knots and they have a beam of a of actually pretty much just over 88 feet each so they would have made okay carriers certainly speed wise would have been better than Bern, but they are only maybe 20 foot longer than eagle which is a converted uh, La Torre class battleship. And they are physically the smallest of the three. So, you know, it would have been the only viable choice for the French if they'd even built from that battle cruise design. But it, I'd hesitate to say it would be a particularly brilliant one. For the Germans, of course, they actually built the Mackensons or were well, partway through building them. But they also have the Ersatz York class, which you, they can draw on, which is a little bit, a um, little bit, bigger only about 10 foot but it's almost 750 foot long probably would have gone up to the high 700s as a carrier displacing about 33 34,000 tons in its normal configuration as a battle cruiser so you know tipped up past the 30,000 ton marker although exactly what it would displace as a carrier who knows and capable of 28 ish knots so you know a, a reasonable speed in cargo style speed it's considerably longer than by about 60, 70 feet than the French potential option. And it's also almost 11 feet wider. So it would have made a, a much better carrier, you know, a, a, a decent ish one. But actually, despite being a battle cruiser it, as a whole form, it's actually, if they retain the speed and only sort of slightly gave an overhang to the flight deck. You're actually still looking at something that's smaller than cargo, which is a converted Tosa-class battleship. And of course, then the ultimate one would be the, the British version of the Admiral-class battlecruiser, simply because the Admiral-class battlecruiser is so much larger. Um, you're talking about 45,000 tonnes to start with, plus minus who knows where they're going to end up as carriers, but already capable of 32 knots. Uh, five foot wider beam again than the Ersatz Yorks and um, almost, well, actually just over 100 foot longer, almost 120 foot longer than a Mackensen or an Ersatz York for that matter, which means maximum hull volume, maximum space and, yeah, the best speed as well. So those would be the three best candidates for battle cruiser conversions into carriers. But of those the Admiral class would be a significantly superior carrier, all other things being equal. And to give you some idea of the potential size of those Admiral class, they're only 14 foot shorter than the Lexington class battle cruisers and only one foot narrower. So you're basically talking a Lexington size battle cruiser or, or turned into aircraft carrier for the Admirals. Glenn Recafrente asks, were there any other instances of kamikaze in naval history? Not the suicide attacks that the Japanese did in World War II, but the original meaning of divine wind referring to the fortuitous typhoons that saved Japan from invading Mongol fleets in the 13th century. Basically, were there other typhoons or extreme weather events that by themselves, or largely by themselves, devastated an enemy fleet, thus saving a navy or a nation? Yeah, there's quite a few, albeit that quite a lot of the time the reprieve was only temporary, so... It, it, whether or not it, it you could classify it as saving a navy or a nation if the enemy just comes back a year or two years later is another matter. For example, in the Punic Wars, the Romans lost a number of fleets to heavy storm weather, which probably kept them those wars going longer because obviously that bought time for the Carthaginians, who generally being the better sailors usually retired to port when storms were brewing which preserved their fleet which meant the romans had to rebuild their own um then all, all through time you have storms which either badly batter or devastate fleets um the romans pop up time and time again julius caesar's invasion for example of britain a bunch of his ships were wrecked by storms which put a little bit of a uh, dampener on his attempt to invade britain although again 
Britain was invaded and became Britannia by Claudius. So it brought the Celts in Britain a few decades, but it didn't save them in the end. Um, one of the most famous, in, in fact, probably the most famous wind-related salvation of a fleet in the sort of period that the channel primarily covers that isn't the Mongol invasions of Japan would actually be the Spanish Armada. Because whilst there were a number of battles between the English fleet and the Spanish fleet up the channel, culminating in the Battle of Graveline or Gravelines or whatever it is you want to otherwise call it, ultimately the bulk of the Spanish fleet was still intact, albeit somewhat battered and missing a lot of its anchors. And then they were driven first by the wind, driven towards a big sandbank, and everyone thought they were going to be driven onto that sandbank and, and wrecked off of the northwestern European coast. Then the wind changed and they were driven north past the uh, east coast of England and then up past Scotland. And then they decided, right, we're going to have to try and go home. And then, as they were going down the west coast of Scotland and the west coast of Ireland, the weather turned even worse and smashed half the armada into rocks, which resulted in the vast, vast, vast majority of the casualties that the armada suffered, and more than anything put paid to any idea of the Spanish turning up again very, very soon with another armada to try and invade England, albeit this wouldn't be the end of the attempts by the Spanish to send armadas, but it would take a while. And it was celebrated as such, recognised as such, in numerous different paintings. The famous Armada painting, obviously, um, it has two scenes. One of the Spanish fleet in the channel. The other scene is of them being smashed onto the Irish coast. And various medals were cast. Very, very few medals and medallions and coins that were cast to celebrate the defeat of the Armada directly credited the English fleet as the primary agent of the Armada's destruction. Um, so, you know, you, you have some which uh, mostly cast by the Dutch because you might think initially that sort of wasn't the, a Dutch versus Spain fight. Well, actually it was because the, the Netherlands was in rebellion against Spain. Uh, the Dutch fleet, the shallow draft fleet, had a reasonable role actually in the Armada campaign, keeping Palmer's army from being able to easily join the Armada. And so they were very, very happy that the Armada was sunk um, uh, for the most part. So you have uh, one coin, uh, they put it all in uh, Latin, obviously, because that's what the, the done thing back then for classy stuff. Um, so one of them translated reads, man proposes and God disposes, which obviously is alluding to God or the wind, you know, God sending the wind to destroy the Armada. And the most famous one is the one you've seen on screen the entire time, um, which reads, Flavit Yehova et Dissipati Sunt, which, um, as you can see here, it uses the Hebrew form of God's name in the Tetragrammaton at the top and translates to uh, Jehovah Blue and they were scattered. And... Whilst this is an able history channel, before I'm sure the like five of you who are probably preparing to jump down my throat as, uh, as to how exactly one translates God's name into English, if you disagree with my particular translation of this coin, go argue with the British Museum and the National Maritime Museum and literally everybody else who has ever translated this coin, <laughs> because that's how they translate it and that's how they list it in La its meaning in Latin and that's how it's always been listed. I really don't have the time for getting in, involved in that kind of silly theological nitpicking. Although, to satisfy some of the nitpickers amongst you, I will point out that, yes, there were other medals cast that specifically spelt everything out in Latin and did say Flavit Dios et Dissipante Sunt, or God Blue, and they were scattered. But they're not the most famous medals, and there you go. <laughs> Coneled asks... What do you feel is the most historically significant naval engagement or campaign, i.e. the biggest di possible divergence in the shape of the world stage between the likely outcomes? The basis would be you know, paper strength or roughly average performance and the likely outcomes based on the abilities of the commanders and nations at the time. So even ignoring unlikely, historically unlikely outcomes that still occurred, like Taffy 3 versus Centre Force. Well, there are a few. Um, obviously, the further back you go, the more difficult it is to look at how things or predict how things might have gone 
otherwise on the world stage. Um, but certainly one of the, I would say, of the top three historically significant naval campaigns or engagements with their obviously knock on result on what then happens on the, on the global stage for the time period that the channel has covered or battles that the channel has covered, which obviously, you know, some people may point to battles in uh, Southeast Asia in the 13th century or something like that, which as I said, not really a subject I'm that well educated on. So I don't really want to try and suggest one way or the other that this would have been massively historically significant if it had gone another way, unless and until I've done more research into that field. Anyway, with that caveat aside, the Battle of Actium is a pretty good one because Yes, the Romans continually have civil wars, and yes, the you know, it's big back and forth as to who actually ends up on the throne. But the Battle of Actium resolved in a lot of ways. It basically it set the stage for whether Octavian was going to become Emperor Augustus or whether Mark Antony was going to end up in charge of the Roman Republic, dash now becoming Empire, and they had very different ways of approaching how they were going to rule. And being that this was, as I just suggested, at the tipping point of Rome going from republic to empire, the impact of a very different leader with very different outlook becoming the ruler of Rome instead of the historical Emperor Augustus would have had an absolutely massive impact on the world scene. Equally, the battle we were actually just discussing in the previous question, the Armada, that has a potential massive divergence because, of course, with the loss of a good chunk of the Armada, it didn't put England into an ascendancy immediately. In fact, England would remain on somewhat on the back foot uh, for a while. But it did provide quite a slap across the face to the Spanish Empire. It meant that the rebellion in the Netherlands uh, could continue on for a bit because, obviously, if the Spanish had taken over England, which was one of the Netherlands' biggest supporters, then they would have moved in to finish them, finish the Dutch off even faster. And it meant that Spain now had to basically orient to face off against enemies in Europe, as well as having to deal with the problems of overseas empire. So if the Armada had succeeded and Elizabeth I had been dethroned, especially bearing in mind that she was the last Tudor, so pretty much any monarch who was then put in her place would have had about the same amount of legitimacy, bearing in mind that James I of England um, only really got the throne because Elizabeth said he can have it, <laughs> and everyone kind of went along with it. Um, you know, that if Britain had been a Spanish colony or Spanish vassal state for, or England had been at least, for any significant amount of time, that would have A, radically altered the balance of power in Europe at the time, significantly strengthening Spain, but B, could also have potentially crippled England's own rise as a naval power, which, yeah, that could have uh, been rather interesting if you have a stronger Spanish empire and no British empire or very much reduced British empire going on. Um, and then another uh, battle, the Battle of Virginia Capes or the Battle of the Chesapeake, which is been depicted on screen for you at the moment that is where although it's not a massively decisive thing tactically as in you know there's not a huge number of ships sunk or captured on either side as i pointed out before you have the british surrounded at yorktown and the british fleet if it is able to win this victory can supply men and material to the british forces ashore and so likewise deny men and material to the American and French troops ashore. And this, the Battle of Yorktown, obviously being seen as kind of the culmination of the American War of Independence, which obviously then gives you the United States of America. If the battle had not gone the way it did and Suffren had not won the battle and instead the British had won the battle, then either they could have evacuated the British forces from Yorktown and the war would have just continued. Um, elsewhere, or they could have reinforced and resupplied them, and possibly, I mean, you can, you're an alternate history, you could throw things into the wind and see what happens, maybe even broken the Continental and French armies on a endlessly reinforced and endlessly resupplied rock of 
fortifications and emplacements. Now, whether that would have ended the American War of Independence with the 13 colonies, or at least a good chunk of them remaining British, who knows? Would it have just led to an even longer War of Independence, which would have cost Britain more because it was very costly, France and Spain weighing in to take chunks out of Britain where they could? And also, obviously, how would that affect the American view of Britain going forward? I mean, America was relatively hostile to Britain for a while after afterwards for somewhat understandable reasons. And there was even still a fairly pro-German, large pro-German faction in World War I. But then, of course, you get, you know, eventually America coming in on side in World War I and then coming in on side a little bit sooner in World War II. How would all that have happened if the Battle of Virginia Capes, the Battle of Chesapeake had gone another way? Who knows? So those would be my three candidates, but I'm sure people can list many others. Well, that's the end of part one. Let's head on over to part two.